everything that you wanted to know about the gallery control. Uh, that's a pretty tall order, isn't it, Kurt? Right. <laughs> Should have put, but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So and, what and are we going to be afraid to ask? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. What? Well, okay. So what all are we going to cover today? Um, so we do have an outline here. Uh, we're going to be going over a lot of basics, tips, and tricks. Um, so something came up this week. Uh, dynamically adding new blank rows. Um, we thought that would be a good thing to go over. Inline editing is a, a big request. How to do inline editing. So if you're familiar with working with a spreadsheet. I mean, you've got rows and columns, right? And uh, you can have rows and columns within a gallery. Well, why not just edit the data right there inside the gallery? And uh, that commonly is called inline editing. So uh, we plan on going over that today as well. Um, and then also data binding. Kurt, what would you define as, as data binding? When you're directly hooked into the table that you're trying to look at, right? So, yeah. yeah. And, there, and there, I don't know. There's, we'll go there later on about it, but it, there's a lot to talk about with that. Yeah. Well, the first thing that pops in my head is you've got a gallery on one side and maybe you've got a bunch of text boxes and things on the right side. I mean, that in, in a way is sort of data binding, but um, I think that's a, uh, an item that we were discussing. We might go uh, various ways on that, but that's the, the first thing that pops into my head. Uh, using a gallery instead of a combo box. I absolutely detest uh, combo boxes yeah, for, for many reasons. And, you know, we could end up creating our own type of combo box. Uh, have you ever had a field where it's pretty much a single line of text, right? But um, it might be departments or uh, things of that nature. And then let's say we've got uh, uh, a new department or maybe departments is the greatest uh, example, but um you know, there's there's probably a good choice of of, of a few things, um, and you might want to add a, a new item to that. You know, in a choice, maybe you got like a drop down, and you want the ability to have them add a new item. So we could do that with a combination of the gallery and make it look much better, rather than it just sort of like popping up and disappearing all the time. Um, although we could do that as well. So I'd like to sort of cover that today. And dare I say, within that topic right there, you know, there's only so much you can do with the controls that are existing there. But you can create with that gallery control, you can make that control look a lot different. And you have a lot more control over what goes, what gets seen, and how you how you look at it, you know, um, compared to just the standard uh, combo box that you have. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, we have the links um, at the bottom of these notes. Now, I'm going to actually share this link with you guys here in the chat. <clears throat> okay, So you guys can sort of follow along. Now, the uh, the notes aren't updated in real time. Um, I have to hit a publish. So it, this, this list and this outline will change over the course of the live stream. And at the end, I will do a publish. And also, I plan on making the MS app file uh, available for download as well. So if you guys want to get at that, you can access that. And then once I upload it somewhere, I'll put the link in there as well. So uh, let's get started, shall we? All right. So um, why why is this such an important control to master? Um, one thing that I I said, Kurt and I were talking this morning. I'm like, it's like the most juice for the squeeze as far as if you're gonna like master you know, just two or three controls within Power Apps. I, I'd say this is one, this is one of them, you know? And then Kurt, you said, it is the central portal to all your data sources. I like it. You, would you like to expand on that, Amy? Yeah, so instead of having to paint, uh, you know, you could just imagine if you were trying to get a look at your data sources and you were trying to do this one record at a time, think of all the labels and, te and uh, text input boxes you'd have to have. Whereas if you've got, uh, this this gallery and you can just put your label and your text box in there and it's going to repeat those items for the whole the whole data source so you're you can actually view your entire data source you can make your own data grid with this gallery you know so it just changes the whole way you um you 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 design your screen right so uh you're actually looking at that that gallery is your window to your data source and you can control the view based on what you're putting in what what labels you put out there 
and what text input boxes or toggles or whatever you want to put in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I would say is um, let's consider all the, the controls that we have at our disposal within Power Apps um, that hold records of, um, you know, a set of records. Okay. So you got a combo box, you got a drop down list, you have the, the gallery, you also have the data table. You have a new modern control, which is like a, a grid. I think they might be calling it a table control. Um, what are are there any other controls that I'm missing here, Kurt? Well, you got your drop downs and your list boxes. You know list those boxes. There's those, one, yeah. those those do that. Um, you know, yeah. So someone's saying me for an entire data source, but none of those have the control that you have in a gallery. That's right. I, I rarely see anybody use a list box in Power Apps. Isn't that weird? It's I know, like I, this rare thing. I, <laughs> I try to do it once in a while just for nostalgia, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what I find whenever we use any of these other controls, um, I think it's called a, a data view and then a grid. I'll say this is a modern control. I'll have to yeah. verify that's the name of it. But out of all, all of these, now the grid is is... Uh, the, the new one is pretty cool. Maybe we'll take a little sneak peek on that and maybe have a completely different video session on that. But <clears throat> out of all these, whenever I use now the drop down list, I use quite a bit. Yeah. I don't use a list box. Um, every once in a while, I'm like, you know, this, this is something simple. I'll use a list box. And then uh, it's like, it's almost like a, a drop down list that's permanently open. Right. Exactly. <laughs> for for yeah. those of you who have never used it. Um, because we use that a lot back in v, the VB6 days, right? The the golden yep. days for for uh, yep. Kurt and Darren. Um, out of all these, it's like the gallery is the most flexible, most awesome control that you have to reach for within Power Apps. It is so flexible. I I have never seen a control in any language be as powerful and flexible as that gallery control. I don't know. To me, that was the whole reason why Power Apps was the big draw to me. You know, is that yeah. gallery control? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, galleries, man, it's so important. So hopefully you guys see why this is so important. Um, and uh, you've got reason to sort of stick around and watch this whole whole session. Um, and what I'm going to try to do, um, it might take me a day or two, but not only will I have a full transcript of this whole video, but I'll, I'll put chapters in there and try to have the chapters broken up so you guys can skip around to the part that you're just looking for. But I'd encourage you guys to watch the whole thing. I mean, yeah. I mean, a matter of an afternoon, hopefully you could say that you've mastered the gallery. Yeah, I've seen I've seen in recent days, I've seen people still using the, the combo boxes um, and tying themselves to that. And then I've also seen people just not even use galleries because they just don't know the power of it yet. So I just really feel like this is a really important topic for a lot of people. Now, some of you guys might have been using this gallery for the last five years, you know, and, and you guys are pretty good at it already. But I just still want to encourage you guys to look at this because there might be some some cool tricks and tips. Darren showed me a couple of cool tricks and tips that and I thought I was an expert at gallery. But then when we were just talking about doing this and, got, and Darren's going through it, he was showing me a couple of things I didn't know about. So, you know, I, I think you're going to pick something up in this if you watch this. Yeah. I, I'm looking. I'm looking at the uh, the comments here, Kurt. So I am Sonoma says Sonoma. I, yeah, I I used to I used to use it for one to many forms. I would use twenty of them. Oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> that sounds a little wild. <laughs> and Mike says, "Good morning from Boston, and good morning to you uh, guys, all of you that uh, come to the the live streaming." And guys, I I, I sort of want to welcome uh, probably the the mass majority of you who are watching this on demand because you know we might get uh, 200 views on the live stream but really what eventually we might have 2000 um so really the mass majority of you are watching this uh, uh you know on demand later on maybe a different day than today i just yeah. want to welcome you um and we are live on tiktok um so that's what i've got this thing up here i keep looking up because i'm sort of monitoring the the tiktok um, actually I've got a comment here. Um, so Stella, the diver, I've mastered a gallery, but typically users want more need to work out how to do drag and drop. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah, it's coming. 
it's coming. Um, so I've got power ups here on the screen. Um, and what I'm going to do is um, let's, you know, I'm going to add a, a new screen to all this. And let's just talk about adding uh, galleries to the screen, just in case you've never done this before. So I go in here, now that they've restructured this menu system, I typically just type in what I'm looking for. I mean, they've got it categorized and I never wanna go through and, and try to figure out, okay, where's the gallery? Is that display? No. <laughs> Is that layout? You know, I, I just, gallery. Oh, look at this, here's all the galleries and we have six to choose from. So um, what I'm going to do is sort of categorize these. So it's really two categories. You got vertical, horizontal, and flexible height, okay? And, and then you've got the three versions, but they're blank. And I always recommend going with the blank. It, you might think, oh, blank, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> but what happens is... If you add, well, I'm going to add the vertical gallery. Now, do you want your rows to go um, down, you know, up and down? That's vertical, of course, right? Horizontal is left and right. So I'm going to click vertical, which is normally what people uh, want to work with and, and see. So here we go. And it added a bunch of stuff. Let me, I'm going to open this up a little bit. And what I should do is make sure I'm at 150% so that everybody can see everything really nice and big on my screen. <clears throat> And uh, I'm going to go into this gallery that you see off to the left side. We have two shape controls. So one is this little rectangle on the side. So if I change rows, you see that little line goes with it. I guess that's sort of cool. Um, yeah. So you've got that. And then you've got this separator. Now, guys, I'm going to show you what I do with galleries. And it's going to completely eliminate the need for such a control. Okay. And uh, it was probably one of the big, I, you know, I've been working with Power Apps for uh, probably about a year until I come across somebody uh, came to me with their gallery and they were, they're having a problem with it. And I looked at it and I'm like, what, How, what's going on here? And then I figured out they, they set two controls and they had the, these perfect grid lines. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you that in the tips and tricks uh, portion of this video, of this session here. We have a arrow icon. Okay. Um, now, guys, if you stick with this format, your app is going to look like a Power Apps app. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I don't know. I don't think it's a good thing. I mean, I love Power Apps, and I'm not trying to say anything bad about Power Apps, but I don't want my apps to look like a Power Apps app. You know, and I think that comes from people just, you know, uh, what we call them, the low code, no code people that are just yeah. like trying to learn how to do this thing. They're just, they're using forms or whatever. And, and uh, they just don't know how to do it, things in a different way. So they just, they just throw stuff in there and let power apps do the work for them. Um, but if you do the work for yourself, your app is going to look like your app and not a power apps app, you know? Yeah. So years ago, I, I used to work with this open source project called .NET Nuke. I actually wrote a book on it. You guys go to amazon.com, search for Darren Nish. You'll find my, my book that um, is not a bestseller. <laughs> it's not a bestseller, uh, but um, I liked it. I liked the book. I thought it was great. Um, but one of the big things, and the book was about theming, getting your your .NET Nuke site to look exactly how you want it to look or your client wants it to look, right? Yeah. And I never wanted my .NET Nuke site to look like a .NET Nuke site because it sort of had a cartoony clunky looking UI, you know, if somebody saw my app and let's say we've got two responses. Uh, one is, Oh, wow, this looks nice. Okay. What is this? And, and people almost excited to learn about your app. Right. Or you've got another one. Oh yeah. That's definitely a power ups app. <laughs> you can see it, right? You can see it. Hey, Darren, you mind me showing you something that I kind of was playing around with you. It asked me to kind of look around on some stuff I was playing with while, while we're here when you're looking at this. Could you go to the transition property? I want you to see this. This is kind okay. of cool. I, I, I never, I'm really glad you asked me to go look for these things because um, I would have never done it. And now I'm really liking it. So change that to pop. Okay. Instead of done, put pop. Right. Now, now run, run your program and go navigate around there. See how it pops up? 
as you're going through. Now, you it, you, it kind of you, you miss it a little bit because it changes things to bold, but you can kind of see as you're moving it, it pops it up. Oh, as I'm hovering, it's it's yeah. moving that around. That's really right. cool. Now change it to push. Oh, and it goes inside. It goes inside instead of out. It's kind of a cool effect, man. Yeah, we were going through all these properties of the gallery, like, okay, what do we want to cover? What don't we want to cover? And yeah. the properties we didn't want to cover is stuff like border color. You know, every right. control almost has a border color. So you guys don't need to. Uh, but whenever, um, okay, so push. Um, when I came across this transition, it said pop and pull or whatever. I'm like, oh, this is assembler. Kurt, you go research this. <laughs> he saw pop and push and said, oh, this is assembler stuff, Kurt. Go look, go look. <laughs> And I sort of like this. I love it. Now imagine now this is kind of a bad, I mean, it's, a, you got a sample data going here, but if you had your controls out there and you had your colors going like you do, you know, where you're selecting it, which we're going to do here in a little bit, that's going to be really a cool effect, man. Yeah. So we have a list of vital properties and um, let's put in there. So it's um, what's the name of the property again? Is it, uh, golly, what was that? Transition. Sorry. <laughs> Transition yeah. is the name of the property. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so transition. So I want to, yeah, transition dot push. Um, so transition is uh, what us programmers would call an enumerated value. So if we say transition, we got three choices, none, pop and push. So and it defaults um, to none. <clears throat> yeah. So the default is none. Um, I would have never looked at that unless you had asked me to go check it out, you know? <laughs> yeah, pop, push. And I'll put the first one there, none, and we'll say that's the default. Okay. So as you guys see on the screen, the, these are the different properties we're going to cover in this session here. Um, so that's cool. You, you found that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Now, what I'm going to recommend, guys, you never – don't ever – use these now if you use them and they work well for you and you like them that's great now if you're a beginner i'm going to say don't even mess with them because let me right. show you what's going right. to happen exactly. first of all what's going to happen you'll bring this gallery here and even connect it to your data source okay what it does to me it may not do this to you but it sort of like squashes all my creativity in trying to make this look really cool uh does it do that for you too kurt or is it yeah, just it me? Does. It does. Yeah. And, and plus you're spending most of the time trying to fix what they put in there to change it. Right. Instead of just putting it in there right the first time, you know? Yeah. Um, so one of the first things I want to do is, well, this, this road doesn't have any type of images or anything. So I'm going to take that out. Okay. What happened? Well, now there's this blank screen, uh, this blank spot. Um, and what I'm used to, and I'm a little surprised it didn't happen here. If I take this one out, Oh, I didn't need that one control. Well, what happened here? Now I've got errors to figure out. <laughs> Idle 2x. What's that? If you're a beginner, this is this is sort of not 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 the greatest, you know. So uh whenever you add a gallery, I'm gonna type that in here again. Yeah, they're they're looking at that and they're saying, Where's my Python at? Go, let me get back to Python here. <laughs> or Excel. Or right? Excel. Whichever you're hey, let me go to Excel, yeah. <laughs> Did you just say X hell? <laughs> no, I didn't, but maybe it sounded like that. <laughs> Exhale. We're exhaling. That was a Freudian slip inside my head. Um, yeah. I want to make sure my uh, TikTok's doing okay here. Uh, looks like it is. Okay. So I always say focus on the, these three. Now, how do you make the decision between these three? Well, do you want vertical or horizontal? That's pretty much what comes down for, for me. Um, now I want to talk about this flexible height gallery. Hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second, Darren. There's something that I must say, because you've told me many times, this is a Darrenism here. Nobody likes horizontal scrolls. No, oh. nobody, nobody likes horizontal scrolls. <laughs> so, I just had to put that in there, man. Nobody's got time for that. Nobody, yeah. <laughs> so if I go in here and I have it horizontal and let's say we got a bunch of records. Now I, I sort of came prepared, Kurt. Look at this. I got some custom stuff over there in my app.formulas. Oh, wow. And I created this thing called sample data. Oh, wow. Okay. What's our sample? Well, we don't have any control. So this is what you might have to deal with if you're working with a 
a blank gallery. Well, you don't have anything. You got a blank slate or a blank canvas, right? Yeah. So the first thing I do is I just add a label at least to see what data's in here. So I'll click on label. Okay, what what is going on here? The, and another thing I, I do right away with a gallery is I go over here and change the border uh, thickness to something other than zero. And you see these items go across. Um, why would you ever want to do that? I mean, I like the flexibility of it yeah. because like, oh, I need to do, I need something to repeat across, across. I'm like, oh, you know what? I need to do some type of a tabbing. That's what I use it for. Yep. You want to create or, your own tab control. Or in the rare case, and maybe we'll get into that later on for the advanced stuff when you're doing nested galleries. Sometimes mm -hmm. that becomes important in that too, right? Absolutely. Um, you know what, Kurt? I want to capture all these little gold nuggets. Okay. Um, I'm going to say the what are templated galleries don't recommend. Okay. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to say uh, blank galleries. And we'll do this. Boom. Um, and perhaps we, we should talk about. Um, yeah, the horizontal uses tab tabbing. Should I have two B's in tabbing? Yeah. Where, where's Jeff where we need him? <laughs> um, and then you mentioned um, nested galleries. Yeah, nested galleries. Very good. Very cool. Um, I would say probably used most at least by me gee whiz yeah, yeah. almost all um time. so here's a qu i've got a good question for you here kurt let's see if you can answer it for me what flexible well why wouldn't i do, always flexible sounds like a, a good thing why wouldn't i want flexible all the time I, it's a lot to manage right it'd be a lot to manage if you were going to do that um yeah. you know i I actually didn't know anything about, I didn't even understand the concept of a flexible gallery until you showed me there was a use case we did. We were working on this big project and it was the only way to get something done. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't really don't know how to answer that question, Darren. Okay. Uh, why, why wouldn't you want to do it? Um, this, that, that's a, this is a good day because I, I'm uh, scooters about to uh, uh, show you something cool here. Sometimes I'll say, Kurt, get ready for your mind to be blown. Uh, okay, so we'll see. We'll have a, a vertical, which is one that I use the most. Let's let's put a little border here, and then on this one that's flexible, let's also put a, a border there too, and we'll add um, a label. Okay, so we'll do that, and then we'll add a label here. <clears throat> you know what I'm going to do? Um, so the the size of each row or cell within a gallery is determined by a property. Okay, I'm trying to click on one. I, I hate this little pop up. Um, <laughs> template size. That's what determines it. So over here, we have a template size um, of 280. So I'm going to go over here and set this thing up to be 280. Okay, I'm going to run both of them. Um, boy, I sort of like this. This. <laughs> you know that, that looks nice doesn't it 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 I mean, does as long as you're uniform but it starts looking it. choppy after if you don't if you don't so this thing dynamically sizes based on what's visible in that in that template okay what is a template the template is something really that, that you want to grab on make sure that you understand what a template is in the context of talking about galleries the <sighs> template is what's going to be repeated, everything you put into the template. So right now, um, for both of these, we have a label right here, right? Um, and everything, and over here we have, we've got two labels. Everything inside the template is being repeated. The template is what it's going to take. And uh, can I, give can, I can I put some other words to what you just said there, Darren, real quick? Because sure. I think that's an important sure. point. When he says, when he's talking about what's going to be repeated, think about your data table, that your, your source, your database table, your SharePoint table. Um, Every, 
every record is going to be repeated. It's going to it's going to show it's going to repeat for each record in that item. So when you set up that template, you're setting it up for the one time. This is what every record I want it to look like, and it's going to repeat that thing that rec for every record in your data source. I just wanted to put that out there because um, I remember when you were telling me about that. I'm like repeating. What are you talking about repeating? And then it just finally clicked on me, you know. But so yeah. Whatever data source for every record or row in that data source, that that template represents one row uh, yeah. within the table of values, right? Yep. Um, so what I want to say on this flexible height is it's going to shrink down to all, everything that's visible within it. And you may not think so until you run it and then it does it. <laughs> so just wanted to, uh, you know, let you guys know about that. Now, What's great about the the um, the flexible height is you can make everything invisible on a particular row. Okay, so right now we've got four records. This gallery is based on this thing called custom gallery sample. And if I click on that downward chevron, it's going to show me the data that's inside. Okay, so this is the data. So we've got four rows here. And um, let's say inside of this, you want all of the odd records. So perhaps we could we could write some code to take out the number. We could do, we could use a function called write. So a write function takes a string and we can just grab the last character in this uh, lipsum type of text and grab that one, two, three, four, right? And then we could do, how do, how do we figure out an odd or an even? Uh, we, we do a modulus, right? Divide by two. And then if we have a remainder, we know it's odd. And then we could base the visible property of everything inside of that, set the visible to false. And then that row would just not be there. Um, that's what's so cool about the flexible height. Now, so I'm, I've told you about the, all the upsides to the flexible height. What are the downsides? Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me go to a screen I have prepared. Okay, it's this screen. And um, my data source, I think I've got like 5,000 records in here. And what I'm going to do, if you look off to the side, we have something called wrap count. Okay. So let's say we got a lot of, what we have here on this screen is we got a, we have a lot of data. You see this little bitty scroll bar? Oh my goodness, this is wild. Right? We got 5,000 records here. And something else you'll notice is we have this blank space right here. So we have enough space to see two records at a time per row. And that's what we're able to do with a, a, a regular gallery. We can go to the wrap count and we can go two. Oh, look what I did there. Look what I did there. One, two, three, four. So that's sort of nice. So we could display more than uh, one thing within a row. Now these are distinct to different records, okay? But you can't do that with a flexible height. That's the drawback with it. I like the flexibility of having that. And while we're talking about the wrap count, you can go up to 10. That's as far, that's as high as you can go. Okay. So if I go back down to my flexible height, what we'll notice here, look at that. That property is not there. If I click on this one, boom, look, wrap count. Click on here. And there is no wrap count. So that's the big thing to keep in mind. You might think, oh, I'm getting something really cool with the flexible height, but you use that flexibility. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So we have a, a question here by uh, Shavam. How can we add new data here in gallery from SharePoint? We're going to get there. We're going to use SharePoint as a yeah. data source Absolutely. here in just a little bit. So Absolutely. just hang on. We're, we're going to get to that. We're going to do some really cool stuff with uh, going to data here with it. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to go back to this screen one as we're stepping through some more of these properties. Um, so this was just a regular blank vertical gallery that I added. Now I had just changed it the rep count to two. I could change that back to one. Okay. So we could do a little bit of compare and contrast. Now this one here on the right, this is the regular vertical gallery, not a blank one. And um, what I wanted to do was sort of look at what these little separators look like if we hook this thing up to some data, okay? And I can tell you right now, I already like mine better than the default <laughs> one. 
All right, let's go back to our, uh, so uh, Kurt, I know a lot of times you're waiting for me to finish my my thoughts. So if you have anything to that you'd like to add to anything I've said in the last five or 10 minutes, feel free to uh, bring no, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've been just using the uh, interrupt Darren in the moment to, to add my stuff. And I, I do want to say that I'm real proud of you about the modulus operator, you know? Oh, really? You know, it's yeah. funny because a lot of people don't like to use that. They don't think about it, you know, but it, modulus can be used for so many different things. I, it's my favorite function in math is the modulus yeah. operator, you know? Yeah, you're really good with, with um, there's a lot of things, Kurt, if I didn't have you as a mentor, I probably would have never known about random, you know, randomly generating numbers, um, you know, going from VB to all the way to, um, yeah. You know, power cool. apps, like, what would I use a random number for? Well, I definitely know that. Um, cool. So what we don't have, um, it is nice and flexible. <laughs> so Rick, Rick says he was told there would be no math. So now <laughs> we're going to offer yeah. your money back, Rick. <laughs> now, yeah. Also, Rick, the, the sales guy might have also promised you there'd be no code in this low code, no code. Right. But, but there is. Right. So, My, yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, they told it, they told us there'd be no code. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. so the rap count. Okay, so we've gone over that. Um, so I'm ready to start talking about these vital properties. Uh, guys, okay. and um, we'll be adding some um, data here in a little bit. Let's talk about the first thing that I typically do. Um, I guess it's not really a vital property, but the first thing um, to it change. Is the, it is the Darren. It's a vital property to Darren. How about that? Yeah, it is. And what I want to do is just focus on the properties that other controls typically don't have. These are these, these things are typically uh, specific to the gallery, but almost every other control has a border, right? Like uh, a text box or almost any of them. But for sure, that's what I do when I get into Power Apps and I add a gallery in here, because as you see, if we go to, I, I, I think I did it on every single one of, maybe except this one. You notice like we got this, measles spot here this little red dot and uh and it's like what what am i looking at what is this and that's how i feel about a gallery until i give it a border so now i come into this and now i'm not like so confused all i have now is like okay there's a there's an error here let me you know set that to zero i guess yeah i almost wish they put that out there by default right set the border on by default but th there might be a good reason Rick, Rick says that's why my apps are that's what my apps are missing. <laughs> the math. A border code no, or math? Math. <laughs> says, you know, I'd have a great app. My, my app doesn't do anything. Why doesn't it do anything? Oh, math. Oh, okay. Oh, I gotta I gotta make it do math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what I end up doing is I go over here and I set up at least probably a two. Um, on the border. And you might want to give some thought on the border color. Now, in my template that I use, I have a theme, you know, dynamic theming set up, and I tie into that for everything. Um, so I just set a, a border of two. Okay. And the uh, properties I wanted to talk about. So that's the first thing I do. The, let's talk about fill and template fill. Okay. That's what gives us the grid lines. Okay, so if you look at Microsoft's gallery, just out of the box, you drop it down here, they put in this little separator. And I wanted the separator, and, and until I, I found out about the dealing with these two properties, I would always be having like a rectangle sitting there that's sort of giving me a grid look and feel to it. But until I came across setting up these two properties, um, that's when it sort of clicked for me. So I'm going to set the um, the fill or the background color. It's called fill in Power Apps. Okay. I'm going to set that to a nice gray color, like a medium gray is typically what I go with. Not too dark, not too light. Um, OK, 
Okay. Now, after we've done after we've done that, I always go over here to the side and I scroll all the way down. And it used to be at the very top, but it's in the T's. It's called template fill. And um, an RGB value of zero 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 is actually black. Okay. Uh, and if you wanted white, you have to say 255, 255, 255. But this zero, this is the transparency. Okay. So if we wanted white, now we can actually just say color dot white. That's nice, huh? Oh, look at that. I sort of like that. Okay. I see what you're doing. Okay. So now we have grid lines and it doesn't look. That's as why you set that back. I used to do that. I'm like, Darren, why are you setting that background? And I do like the light gray because it kind of goes with everything. And and uh, I don't know. That's pretty smooth, man. I like because okay. I used to wonder why you did that, but now I understand. So I'm I'm really glad that uh, um, okay. you invited me to this live stream. So maybe there are a, a, a few things in here that you, you see me do that uh, we got the chance to sort of like unpack and look at. Yeah, exactly. So this is what I did to create my own sample data, Kurt. I, I used your uh, sequence function. I call it your sequence function because you taught me a lot of things about that I didn't even know. <laughs> There's multiple parameters you can pass in here. You can. I, I had no idea about that. I was like, oh, wow. Great. I'm going to say FX theme mean gray, like my gray. Okay. Don't you love the app.formulas place? We just do. put all these pieces of code here that we can call instead of putting the app on start. Um, and then for the, bo the border color, I sort of want it to match that same color. So instead of the theming, we're going to say FX theming gray. So, so Darren, you're going to have to go back through because some of these users are going to wonder what, what the heck did you just do? So go back to that for all statement and just kind of walk that through one time, just real fast. You don't have to go for a long time on it. Sure. <sighs> Oh, you know what? I should probably make us a little smaller, Kurt. We're not yep. we're not the stars of the show. Power apps is. Yep, that's exactly <laughs> right. All right, so here we have the loop. And what what would you like to look at here? So you're doing a you're doing a sample data, and you're doing a for all. And you're sending all that in. So what where where are you putting that into your um? So each record you're setting that up into the into the sequence table. Is that what you're doing? So the sequence function gives us almost a table value, or you could call it an array, okay? So we have a bunch of uh, rows there, and we have a, a column that will give us a value of numbers, okay? So within a, a for all function, you could say this record, and it's going to reference the individual item that we're traversing. Look at me using big words. Right. Now, you could have done an as my there, and instead of this That's record, true. you could have used your alias, right? I could have. And, and when he says my, it's just any any name you want to give it. Yeah, my. And a lot of times, what I found is this record, sometimes Paras gets confused with it. It does. It can't handle ambiguities very well at all. Yeah. So a lot of times I'll do that, that my there, and then... A lot of times, sometimes I'll, like FX my blue or my gray, uh, if, if you're hurting for a, a name <laughs> to call something while doing an app, just call it my this or my that. Um, something I use a lot. Now, so, this, is, this is new I've not seen before, Darren. You're using that custom gallery sample that you created. You're not doing right. a patch here. You're not doing any kind of patch. You're not doing any kind of uh, anything in here. This is... This is good stuff here. What are you doing? How, how are you getting that information in there? Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm looping through 5,000 times and sequence allows us to do that. Okay. Now, if I say my dot value, so the first one's created will be a, a value of one. The next will be two, three, and all the way through. Um, and then I wanted some text in here as well. Okay. Now, in order to describe what I'm doing, I want to show you what, what we have here. Um, if I go to a different screen that actually has the default lipsum values, hey, look at this. Here's the default value of a gallery, custom gallery sample. And you go in here, and it's got some uh, lorem ipsum text, both in a short form and a long form. 
And what I want to do is I just want to get that text. I, I probably should have just typed it, but I could get at the sample text over here and it could be longer, mm -hmm. you know? And then what I did is I, I just took off any numbers because it does one, two, three, four. And I just wanted to get at that. So the whole thing that I'm getting at by doing all this first and, and whatever is I just wanted to get that sample heading and I wanted to, um, take out the number like the one, two, three, four, and instead just use my value one through 5,000 and put that in there. What do you think of that, Kurt? I, I, I love it because you're not having to use a collect or, or a patch or anything that substitute would put that information in there. Yeah. Patty yeah. loves us like math for the bouncing ball. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, David says, brilliant. Uh, morning from New York. Morning to you. All right. So uh, Roger says, how can we bind show multiple SharePoint lists? Oh, my goodness. With four or five co uh, common columns, data in a single gallery. Okay. Collections. Do a join. Yes. So let me answer this in the most simplest way, hopefully in about 30 seconds here. If you, want, if you have all data from different sources that you want to display in a gallery, um, the first thing you want to decide, you need to zero in on one of those lists that you want to have represented for each record being displayed. Okay. And um, so that's the first thing. And then when you're inside the record, uh, the, the template, remember we talked about the template? You can refer to these other collections with a lookup or a filter. You'd use a filter if you're doing a, a nested gallery. But if you need to do lookups now, I, I strongly discourage people from using lookups, filters, any type of database transaction, like going to a server um, to get the data within a gallery. And But there's an exception to that. If you know it's only going to be a very small record set, there's probably not going to be much of a performance set. And that's why I discourage people is because that could really make your app very, very sluggish uh, and, and very much not scalable. So, um, so one exception is there's not much data. So let's say you've got a SharePoint list out there and you've got a list of 20 departments. That's probably no big deal. What Power Apps will do is we'll bring over all 20 departments and every time you do a lookup, it should be it should be working with the in memory um, representation of that table. Okay. Now the ultimate safest way is to use an in memory collection by using stuff like collect, clear collect. Okay. And uh, or like a, a variable or something you set up here in the app.formulas because it's right there in memory. PowerPoint doesn't have to go off to some uh, some other server, um, some SharePoint or uh, SQL Server or Dataverse even, um, it's just right there in memory. And you're not going to get much of a, a performance hit or waiting time to go get the data. Now, if you've got 5,000 records, uh, you know, you've got tons and tons of data, you might be using up a lot of memory, but um, you, you shouldn't be getting the, the performance hit. You know? um, oh, of course, yeah, Roger has a second, an efficient way without using collection. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you you took away the uh, the one thing that um, of of how I how I do that. So, if you want an efficient way, then what you want to do is create some type of a view. You have views in Dataverse, and you have views in SQL Server. Now, you do have views in SharePoint, but um, I'm not. I I've never been able to pull in a view of SharePoint in as a data source. I can do that with Dataverse and SQL Server, but that's how I would um, do this. If you're gonna tell me I can't use a collection, then you wanna do joins within a view, okay? And then you pull in that view as a data source. And that's that's how you could do that. And that would be uh, fairly efficient. Okay. Oh. And go ahead. Mm -hmm. go ahead and finish what you're doing. Sure. Roger says there's going to be a lot of data in each of those. More than two thousand. Okay, uh, I'm gonna. I want to be honest with you, Roger. I would. I mean, without sort of derailing the the whole live stream and and um, going into your situation, I would really caution against that. Why, why is there ever a reason to display 
two thousand or more records on a screen. I, I don't know. I mean, you're going to make your app sluggish right there, whether they're in memory or in a database. Uh, I feel I, I would typically want to sort of filter those down somehow. You know. So what what are your thoughts, Kurt? I I agree. I unless he's just talking about um, there's there's going to be two thousand records to sift through, but right, you would filter those down and then bring those in. Um, if you can, it tells me that there, there's maybe something more that you can do with that. Maybe not. Maybe you got a, a really unique use case. But most of the time, when I've got two thousand records or more, there's something I can filter that to knock that down just a little bit more. Um, you had a great, great example. Um, one of our accelerator students was talking about needing all these different counties in the in the in the country, and there's well over two thousand countries or counties in this country, right? So. Um, but so we're looking at, we're like, well, how do you do that? Well, Darren says, uh, put in a zip code or put in a state. What's how many counties are in that state? There's not 2000 in that state, you know? So you get, if you narrowed it down to the state, now you can just get the counties for that state instead of that, you know? So it's just a little bit of creativity. Maybe you can do it that way. Um, <clears throat> Absolutely. And I, I definitely like the idea of using a collection and, and creating a join within that collection so that you could join multiple tables within that. Um, and, and it's absolutely doable. You can do a join right inside of power apps. You know, you can't do joins within That's power apps. What are you talking about, Kurt? That's what, what they say. Mean? That's what they say, but you don't listen to what they say. We can do it, Darren. <laughs> um, Kurt, you blew me away uh, with this module you have for the accelerator students talking about collections. <laughs> you do so many wild things in here. You found things that I, you know, collections as arrays, collections and joins. You started talking to me one day about three dimensional arrays. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I, I mean, I can sort of think about them, but what, what do you, and you did it. You, you did it and you did it well. <laughs> Thank you. That's fun. That's, it was, it was awesome too. You know, um, I just like to go, you know, when you show something, just like, what can we do with this thing? Let's go play with it and figure out what we can do. You know, um, I want to go back because there's a point I, I don't, I don't want to derail the whole live stream. I like what you said yeah. there, but I want to go back to that code block that you just had right there because okay. I was still, I was hung up on why are you doing this without a collection? Why are you doing this without, without the patch? And I'm just dawned on me what you're doing. Okay. So, so that that sequence is creating a table. Okay. It's actually creating a table, a small one dimensional table with views and the, the for all statement returns every function returns a value. Well, what does the for all statement return? It returns a table. So you're actually creating the table within that sequence, within that for all, and, and you're taking the return value and you're putting that in sample data. So you don't need to use the table function because you're not you're creating the table with the return type of the for all. That's the magic. The return of the for all is the table. I love it. That's the first time I've seen that code. And I think that's just really... <laughs> You know, you 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 done some pebble snatch in there, bud. I'm just not gonna <laughs> lie to you. I think that's pretty neat stuff. I don't know if if you guys are seeing that. Um, it may and maybe I'm just like sometimes you know I get hung up on the littlest thing, but that is amazing to me right there. Okay, you did it. You did us. You did that without using a a collection or a patch. Yeah. yeah. My goodness. And yeah, for each iteration in this loop. We've got, I'm, I'm using a curly brace. I'm like, let's see if, a, if I can just put a curly brace in here. So I'm creating a record by putting these little curly braces in there. And then inside of the curly braces, I'm, I'm pretty much creating my, uh, you know, my record type. My You're, creating record. Yeah. You're creating a record. Yeah. You're creating a record right there inside of the sequence. Or the for all, <laughs> the for all, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm impressed. I really want to take a look at that and, and break that down a little bit more on my own. So. Okay. We want to make sure we put that somewhere where I can get a hold of it. Okay. I, I, I'm serious. I really like that. And I think that there's some more work that can be done with this. Okay. <clears throat> very good. You guys just seen something that was just very unique and not talked about much. And see, he was just going to yeah. just go, hey, yeah, you know, it's just, I'm just doing this. I was. Not even about it. And, and I'm like going, oh my goodness, look at what he just did. <laughs> I'm going I'm to keep a, a running uh, list uh, of the reasons why I need Kurt on the live streams, <laughs> slow me down, go into things that I think that are like, 
yeah, everybody knows this, you know? Right. <laughs> no, that's great, man. Well, you know, you've, you've played with power apps a lot. You've been working with power apps. You are a power apps expert. There's no doubt about it. And so, yeah. I, you know, it's like, you know, for some of us that are still, we haven't had an opportunity to do all those things. We know what the, what the, the normal stuff is, but that stuff right there, that's a pro tip right there. That's a straight <laughs> like pro that. tip. Yeah. Oh, people pay big money for that there. Do they? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so back where people pay big money for this. <laughs> you stole my thunder, Kurt. You stole that's my thunder. Funny. That's funny stuff. So uh, we don't want to derail the show anymore here. So let's get back on track with what you're going to do here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to get through these vital properties, and I haven't quite um, done this thing yet. Uh, so the fill – so trying to do grid lines within a gallery. So – we did that by setting up the um, the color. And if you click on color there, you see that it's actually called fill. I hate when Power Apps does that. It calls it one thing over here, like data source. If I click on data source, oh, up here, now it's called items. Well, why can't you just pick with one and, and go with it, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you set the fill and then you go to template fill and I did white there. And that's what's gonna give us our grid lines, okay? Look at that. Now it doesn't look too elegant. It's almost too thick, uh, in my opinion. However, we're, we're getting there. Okay. Yeah. And um, a number that I like to go with, and you can play around with this and decide what you or your uh, client or customers like. I like to go with a, a template padding of two as the most and one as um, the the least there. So it looks a little nicer there. Just uh, you know, two pixels instead of five. Five is the default. Okay. So um, are we done with this? Uh, you know what I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, duplicate this first screen. If I ever do a, make a big edit to a screen, I'll always sort of back it up like that. I'll be back in just a moment there. Okay, sure. So I'm going to expand this a little bit. Okay. Zoom out a little bit. Okay. So we set up those two columns, and we also modify the template padding. Fill, template fill, and template padding. You need to set up those three properties to make the grid lines look right there. Okay. Now let's talk about items. Okay. Well, you're going to have your data source in here. Okay. Um, so you might be using a SharePoint list, data verse. I'm just gonna say, uh, yeah, data verse table, um, SQL Server table. We could have all kinds of different data sources. We could have collections. Okay, so I should probably do something like this. Get this right. Um, so this is just a few examples. We could, you know, last last Saturday, we looked at creating our own Outlook, our own email client <laughs> using the Outlook connector. And that was pretty cool. Well, guess what? You can use connectors, other connectors. But if you think about it, SharePoint is actually a connector. Dataverse is a connector. It's a SQL server um, collection. That's going to be in memory. But other connectors... Office 365 Outlook, I think is what it's called, but it could be all kinds of things. So you could put that in there. Right now I'm using an in-memory collection, okay? So there was a question like, hey, how do you set this up with SharePoint? Okay, so if I bring up my SharePoint here. I, I did have a quick question. I didn't know if you wanted to answer that before that or you want to go ahead and do the SharePoint thing first. Does it have to do with data sources? Yes. Okay, yeah, sure. What you got? Um, <laughs> Can you put in the square bracket? Can you put a square bracket and array in, into a, uh, a gallery? And within that, can you formulate a record within the square bracket and array? 
What was the second thing? Formulate a what? A record. You know, the curly braces. Can you mm. differentiate? Can you put curly braces inside of that square, square bracket? Okay. Yeah. So let me show you something, something that I learned while. So if you'd be able to, to um, you know, what I'll do is I'll just put it in here because there, I've got quite a bit to say about that. Okay. And I want to finish my thought before I go into that. So yep. data source, I'll actually put in here an array. And what I'm going to say is, oh yeah, square brackets. And we could say, um, say yes, no, and a maybe. Right? Like Have you guys ever seen that in Power Apps? I don't like it. So if I add over a drop down, okay. Now that I now that I've added it to so my my um, outline, I won't forget about it. So um, I'm going to go over here into a SharePoint list and pull in. Hmm. Type of data. Why raw data might be good. Let's use raw data. So in order to add a SharePoint list as a data source, you click on data over here off to the side, and I'm going to click add data. And they're trying to get us to use tables. So these are all Dataverse data sources. Um, that Of course, they want you to use uh, Dataverse, but go into connectors, and then we'll go look for SharePoint. Okay, There's SharePoint. And um, I'm presented with four. Uh, <laughs> which is sort of a weird thing. I, these are all the same as so I just always click on the first one. Okay. And there is my SharePoint list. Now let's say none of these are the SharePoint uh, sites that you want to access. Okay. What you want to do is click on this little square, which will take you to the default home page or URL for that SharePoint site. You copy it and you paste it right here. I'm going to click connect. Now that will immediately take me to all my document libraries that I can connect to and all my lists. Nice. So I'm going to go down to raw data and I'm going to add it. And there we go. Um, now I'm going to make a copy of this screen because I'm about to make some uh, big changes. And um, so for this data source, we click on data source and we can just say raw data, just type it in there. And what you may have noticed is that we have a data source here and we can go into these drop downs and you can pick one. I don't like to do that because a lot of times you want to add to this. And if you click on this downward Chevron, you can be able to look at the data. Okay. I love that. I love that downward Chevron. I love it too. Wow. I lock it out. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this label a little bigger here. Okay. So we can see more of what we're working with. Okay. So to answer um, the question that, that came across, how do you add a SharePoint list? Well, that's, that's how you do it. So the person that, that asked that I need to go up there and maybe find out who they, they were here. Um, and uh, so if you have any questions about that, please let me know. Um, so here's a question from Patty, which is, Darren, can you show us how you set up the RGBA in formulas? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I'm going to go up here to app formulas. Okay. And that's what this is right here. Okay. So the RGBA function, it takes three values. Okay. So the first one is for, it goes RGB. Okay. R is for red, G is green, and B is blue. And you can pick between zero and 255 for each of those, okay? And with those given three color values, you can come up with almost any color that you can imagine. And then the fourth one is the opacity, if it's transparent or not. Uh, zero being fully transparent, one, I'm sorry, one being fully, of being fully visible and zero being fully transparent you can give it a percentage and it will be half of that or sort of see through. Okay. So that gives us a lot of flexibility. So now, go ahead finish what you're going to say. Sorry. 
I thought you I was just I was just gonna ask Patty. I'm like, hey, is that does that was that the answer you're looking for, or was there something more to that that question? All right, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, but yeah, yeah Patty, definitely. Yeah. If that's more, if you need more to that, but I wanted to say now that we know this, now that Darren has shown this for you, accelerator students, and I see that we have a few of them out here. I want to challenge you guys into making a function. Doing passing, uh, is it going to be a theming like for your for your different kinds of theming? If I want this cut kind of theme, or if I want that kind of theme, like you got theming blue, theming gray, we could put that into a function and return which one we needed. Um, and I wanted to challenge you guys to just take Darren's example and maybe make a make a function out of that. Yeah, that's interesting. I like it, Picasso, Picasso. All right, so we've added a, a SharePoint data source there. Okay, so we've definitely got that. Let's go back to my, my list here. And let's talk about this array thing that you brought up, Kurt. This is great stuff. And I learned this by, um, I don't know where I saw this. Maybe it was, I think it might have been a radio button. Look at this. Nope, it's just radio sampling. I don't know where I saw this but this is what I saw somewhere <laughs> and I'll share it with you. You could create an array with square brackets. Okay. And it's, it's telling me it's going to be a table value. Okay. So you know how curly braces denote a record square brackets denote a table. Okay. And what we could do here is just give it some values of um, yes. No, we could have a blank value. We could have a maybe. Yeah. And some people are like, well, I want the first item to be blank. You know, I want to know if they answered it or not. Okay. So let's, let's go look at this drop down list. We got a blank. Yes. No, maybe. Okay. I didn't have to use a choice field, which I, I recommend never using a choice field. No, never, never. I'm going to create a video and it's going to call never use a choice field. Never, never. And it just could be me and Kurt and say, never, just don't do it. And then we'll explain it. And then we'll say never again. <laughs> it, it just, just on that topic, it blows my mind that we say that so many times. And then we come, when people come back with their projects and they got all these choice fields in there, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and we might get the question, well, okay. So let's say that there are things that you, you that Kurt and Darren always say, never, never, never. And I, I see Mike says never. <laughs> um, so here, so here, let me put it in this context. Um, what about a lookup column, Kurt? Should we say never use a lookup column? Yes or no? Uh, in, in SharePoint. <laughs> See, there it is. There's the question. When we're talking about lookup columns in SharePoint, boom, never, ever never. use them. Now, what about Dataverse? No, that That's is what you do there, right? Always, always use lookup in Dataverse. Never use lookups. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, with uh, never use choices. Lookups, it depends, okay? A lookup, it depends. Uh, on the data source, okay? If you use a lookup with in uh, SharePoint, you're going to have delegation issues and stuff. But in yeah. Dataverse and SQL Server, you don't. I, I just want to take that one step further. Uh -huh. Whenever I come across an existing SharePoint list that has choices, I go to the trouble of adding columns and pulling that choice value out so that I can look at it. I do not want to even look I at it inside that. Yeah. I would too. It's a complex type. And I recommend sticking with your simple types as much as possible. Now look, look at what we did here, Kurt. We've got, this could be a choice, a choice column. Yes, no, maybe. But it's here in the app. What I would rather do in the database, in the data source, I would want to use a, a column that's just single line of text. And one of these values will only always be one of these values and it will just be displayed there. You know, if you want to force somebody in the app to pick one, well, boom, we've just done it. And it's like, well, what happens if somebody goes to the SharePoint list? Like, no, don't, don't let anybody know about the SharePoint list you're using as a database. You Thank never you. want people going into the SharePoint list and editing the data. That's bad, bad, bad. <laughs> That's bad. You, yeah. I That's just want to say something in there because um, I knew you were on a roll and I didn't want to stop it. But so, so within that, I want to say that, you know, you, with, with your data sources, it, this goes along with the, the rules, the business rules, keep your business rules inside of the app, not inside of the table. Okay. Like, you know, like a lot of times with records, 
you know, you can have business rules within each record, with each each field. You can have a required field, or you can have the you could put business rules inside of them. Never, I never do that. I always do the business rules inside of the app. I make my required fields, my requirements be from within the app. I have control over that. It's the same with this. This follows that same rule, right? So you're going to control the choices, not not the table, you know. Yeah, I mean, somebody could go in and change the choices in the in the SharePoint list if they if they have the access to do so, um, and um, yeah. So let me know if you guys have any questions on that. We recommend never using a choice. Um, and with the lookup that the lookup type of columns we we're talking about before, it really depends on the data source, right? How do you do a lookup type of column in SQL Server? You don't. There is no column type called lookup. <laughs> Right. Okay. That tells you anything. Now you can create a relationship and which is essentially what you're doing in, in Dataverse. When you create a lookup column, you're creating a relationship between two teams. And you're so, you would sort of be doing that in, in SharePoint, but SharePoint was not designed for power apps. Uh, and I don't know that it was designed to be used as a, a, a really, really good data source either. You know, it's just there to, to be easy for um, lay people to go in and create a quick list to, to hold some data. And I would, I would say it's, it's better than using a, a spreadsheet, you know, yeah. Yeah. but, um, and then how do you, you know, working with choice fields, how do you set up a choice field within SQL server? There is no way to do a choice field within SQL server. You just create a separate table. So your data is going to be more portable this way then, right? You, if you need to move it between things, if you just put it in a single line of text and keep it away from the complex data types and you later on, somebody wants to take it from SharePoint to SQL Server, it's going to be a lot easier uh, port than it would be if you had uh, complex data types. Yeah. You know, um, um, one other thing I wanted to say in that really quick before you moved on from the square bracket. Sometimes you'll see this. This is a perfect one right here. Yes, no, maybe. You might see that field. I like to use those in drop down list box that Darren just did right here. You might use that in a lot of different places within your app. And instead of having to type that all out, if you're going to, if you're going to put those square bracketed hard coded values, mm -hmm. put that, if it happens more than one time, put that up there in the formulas and just oh, yeah. give it a, and give it a name, a, a, a value name, you know, instead of having to retype that out every time for every drop down list box. Okay. F X. Yes. No, maybe. Yep. Does just that like work? That. It looks like it works. I sure like it. Are. I like having all my stuff in one spot like this. This is great. Yeah. So I instead agree. of doing this, Kurt, and having it repeated everywhere, and if we went to add an item, then we have to add it in several places. And that violates our dry principle, does it not? That's right. That's right. Which is DRY, don't repeat yourself. Probably so the most important rule. Yeah. Yeah. So it still works. Okay, that's good. Um, now, I, I do see a question here by David. What is the simplest way to implement lookup columns in SharePoint? No, don't I, do that. <laughs> I, I think what he's referring to is the lookup columns in Dataverse, like the way that we do it in Dataverse was the simplest way of do it, replicating that in SharePoint. Mm -hmm. And that is, there's we have entire videos on that, I think would be the answer to that. I don't know. Yeah. So um, <laughs> lookup columns are fine in Dataverse. In my opinion, they're, they're not so great in SharePoint, and I recommend never using lookup columns in SharePoint. So the simplest way to, to, to implement a lookup column, I mean, there's only one way to do it. You just create a column and, you know, column type, lookup. That's the simplest way of creating a lookup, but, but I'm, I'm recommending you don't do that. Now, there might be a second thing that I think Kurt was alluding to is like, okay, well, if I want a relationship, how do I do it then? You know, Definitely. and it just so happens to be that I am a relationship expert out on YouTube. I don't know if you guys know that or not. If you do a search for relationship advice and put in Darren Neese, you're going to get all types of relationship advice uh, on YouTube. Look at that. This is the video that I recommend checking out. And I show you how to do it in SharePoint. And essentially what you do is you're going to have a numeric type as a foreign key. And you put the ID from the from the primary table into that field. Okay. You know, Darren, you talk about relationships so much. You should have your own afternoon TV show. I think once a week is probably in all that people can hand, handle of me, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jan says, 
Yeah, Rick, Rick, what's that? Rick says some of the relationship advice is about power apps, even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's hilarious. Yeah, I, and I did share a link to that video I was recommending there uh, in, in the chat. Uh, very cool. All right. So, um, did I did we finish all of our thoughts about lookups yep. and choices? Um, because these are things that come up in live streams that you know I'm not I don't have like a video just about hey, don't use uh, choice or how you should use lookups and all that type of stuff. So it's sort of cool that it comes up here and there like this. Um, what I want to do here is this data source that we created for the yes, no, maybe. What you asked me, Kurt, is, hey, could we use that square bracket stuff as a data source in a gallery? And look at that. Well, look at that. Yeah, it works fine. And you could probably delineate records inside of those uh, each comma too, right? So you could probably have separate fields inside of that too if you needed to, if you want yeah. to go, if you want to go crazy. Yeah. So, so you're saying we could add additional. So if you don't give it, see down here, we said ID and title. We created our own record and our own collection here by doing that. ID and title. Those are the two things that are there. Well, what is this? Well, if you don't specify any name of a column, what's it going to do? It's just going to give you a default of one value, value right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's take a look at this. So this is that so if we're going to indent it properly that's what it would look like um so what you're saying is we could have more than these so i think at that point if you want to specify more at this level right here you're gonna have to start using curly braces if you want to start defining more fields inside and, of, and that's uh, what i was asking can you do that can you create curly brackets at every comma and have different records in there if, if you wanted some other information in there i don't know what you'd put in there in this case but you know my title Let's do that. This is very cool. Yes. No. Do you know, you guys know you can drag around code so you can select some code that you want and then just drag it over and we'll move it. Some people don't know that. I learned that back in the, back in the day when you were teaching me. <laughs> so look at this. Um, I guess it needs to be in double. Maybe I didn't drag it right, quite right. There we go. And now we need commas between our records. Each one, okay. yeah. Okay. okay. So I believe that is how you would do that. Yeah. Okay. So I go back to the screen here. We're using this. I mean, our label's messed up. It was looking at value before, but now what do we have? My, My title. Title. Look at there. So there you go. That's how that's how you get it done. And I would recommend guys to I mean you saw that how simple it was before. I recommend always doing something like this because it's just a matter of like an hour passes as you're working on a screen or an app and you're like, "You know what? I need another field in there." Cuz yep. you might want to filter it based on or you know, sort it by another column like sort order. I mean, there's all kinds of things and it would be much easier to add things to it if you had uh, set it up like this, okay? Absolutely. So you saw how you can do it really simply, but you can start making it very complex and, and flexible, that option. But, but the nice thing about it is it's consistent. All these different things, the, square, the curly braces everywhere is a record and the square bracket is everywhere as a table, you know? I, I just think it's great. Yeah, sort of is, yeah. Uh, Amor says, gosh, he taught me relationships so well, now I can't do it from the back. Now I can do it uh, from the back of my head. That's awesome. I love it. Okay, Kurt, what's our next topic here? So we said in arrays, uh, you know, I call those arrays, but as you saw when we I selected everything within the square brackets, it actually said table. Okay. Um, so also table with square we got that. We added in a SharePoint list. Well, that could have been a, a Dataverse table, SQL Server table that we bring in, a collection, so on and so forth, okay? So we've talked about how to add a data source, okay? But these are the other things that you might also want to do there in the data source for Power Apps. So if I click on the gallery, look at items, there is my SharePoint data source, but 
maybe we only want to display a subset of those. Maybe we want to do a search, a filter. So just sort of keep that in mind um, that, that that is a very typical thing. Um, one, one of the big questions at a beginner level that uh, Power App students really wrestle with is like, hey, I've got my data showing on this screen and I only want them to see their data. I don't want, I mean, if they saw other people's, you know, salary information or something, that would be really bad. It's like, well, you need to filter it, you know, filter it based on what they should see. And you should have a column out there that sort of determines that they should be seeing it or not. Right. So um, I'm sort of curious in here, who is, if you look at it, simple way of, of do, doing this is say created by. Okay. Now look at this. This label doesn't like it. Well, this is a complex data type, a complex data type. <laughs> You've got like a, a, you know, it's not simple. You got to use another dot to get at other things. Okay. So let's look at display name. Who did all this? Darren Eves. Well, what we could do, I'm going to copy that. So if you want people to only see their data, this this might be a good example of doing so. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're doing that because there's a lot of people that don't understand. You could put the filter right inside of the item's property. Yeah, absolutely. So the first parameter for a filter is the data source. It could be a collection. It could be another filter function. It could be another, it could be a search function. Anything that returns a value, you can put in there that first thing. And then this filter function where you filter whatever you give it there. And then the second parameter is the criteria by which you filter things out. Okay. In this case, I want to see uh, where the, the created by dot email. I like that better because there could be two John Smiths in a large organization. Yeah. So I might say something like Darren at, I'm going to get this email easily by because i don't know what it um what i'm using as an email in this environment i, I can that's not what i wanted okay. sometimes organizations will have multiple email addresses for the same person so you want to tie into the email address that power apps picks up on okay so we're going to use the user function and say email I'll run this, this is a text box. That is my email address for this tenant. And you don't want to ever misspell something. So that's good that we copy and paste rather than try to type it. Okay, so this should only give me my data. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, what is the main field over here for raw data? I thought it was title. So if we go down here into raw data, okay, we're probably going to see a, uh, okay, look, <laughs> this was a an Excel spreadsheet. Remember, Kurt, where we took somebody's Excel spreadsheet from the, the, uh, the free Power Apps Learn community, and they're like, hey, turn this spreadsheet into a, a Power App. So we did it. This is the data from that. So if I go into a list setting, let's go find out the, <laughs> it's a bad name for a, <laughs> okay, look, do you see what I see down there? It says title down there below. Title. Yeah. Okay. So make sure, hey, hold on a second. What he's looking at, there you go. Okay, you're doing, you're doing it. Yeah. So look what he's looking at. He's looking at the bottom left corner of that grid down there. The, the bottom left corner of your screen shows that if you look at the very end of it that's covering up our heads right our heads are covering up right now oh um, the he was it's okay you do really good darren at this it's amazing how fast you can get around and and i throw stuff at you all the time and you're just reacting to it so yeah. <laughs> um, so look at down at the, that little black uh line black background with white text at the bottom there and it's at the end of it it says title that's what he's looking at. He's doing all that work to get to the actual name that SharePoint recognizes. That's a that's a pro tip, guys. People pay yeah. big money for that. We'll pay um, big money for this. I, I mean, uh, you don't think to look there, but that's the first place he looks. Yeah. 
especially when I, I start seeing spaces and slashes and whatever. And at the very time, if I don't see a title, that tells me right there, somebody changed the title and I never change. If, if a data source tries to give me something, I'm like, give me whatever you want to by default. Okay. So in a SharePoint list, it always starts to give me title. I might set it up to not be required, you know, and I may or may not use it. Okay. But I'm never going to rename. Okay. So here's a never, never, never. Thing. That's my rule too. That's my rule too. Yeah. Inside of SharePoint, this specifically SharePoint, never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever change the name of a field. Never. Oh my goodness. That'll kill you. Yeah. yeah. Cause over in, in uh, power apps, you'll say, Oh, this is the, this is the name of my column. So you might copy that and go over here and you're looking for that. Okay. Nope. You may or may not find it, but if you say, title now it's gonna it's what's funny is it didn't give me it on intellisense that see that's the weird thing that's another reason why you never want to name it um and you're like well if you had okay so it's ohs okay so if i go in here most of the time it will not give you ohs now now it does do they fix it kurt i don't know it might have just been like five time. years or whatever it's been like that and now they're gonna I think it's still inconsistent because I, I came across it the other day. Maybe it de depends on what version you're using. I don't know. Well, look what we have to do here now, Kurt, because we have spaces, because we've got a special symbol like a forward slash. Yeah. Now we need these single quotes all over the place and look how long it is. Yeah. That's, a, that's another rule too. I don't like to use spaces unless you came up with one reason. And it's the only reason is a model driven model driven. You need spaces if you're going to do a model driven program, but but yeah, don't. And, and that's also Dataverse too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, which in Dataverse you can rename things, um, but and you can put spaces in them. Um, but but yeah, Dataverse uses those. Um, but there's a lot less uh, emotional trauma that you'll go through with <laughs> renaming <laughs> other data sources. SharePoint, you know, uh, yeah, don't do it. So. Um, so I'm referencing the title here and uh, let's go back. Let's sort of refresh what we're talking about here. We're talking about what we want to have in the items property. So the data source, we've done a filter. Um, we can do a, a, a search and a sort. Was I about to share something? And, oh, I was just talking about how to filter based on the user. And then the label yep. was for some reason. There was one thing I wanted to say, if you could go back to that filter real quick. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with this. When he says criteria, and I know you guys are going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when he says criteria, that means whatever that evaluation is, it's going to re it's going to return a true. It's going to result a true uh, result. It's going to come up with a true result. Okay. Whatever you put on that comma after that. So you got raw data and then you got comma and you see you got a left and right operand with, with, with the equal sign that, that, that criteria, that's what he calls criteria that must yeah. result to true. That's what's going to return. In fact, he can replace that whole thing with the, the term true. He can just put true there and, and it'll just return everything. Right. But it would, but that's the, the point I'm wanting to get at is you got to make that a true that that's got to result to a true uh, outcome. Now you could say not to make that equal, but it's going to be whatever is false. That'll be true if something is false and it <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm putting some good comments there. So the first parameters of the data source, the second one is the criteria. Yeah. If if I I just said true in here, if if you want to just comment out your your criteria, maybe it's not working right. Just put true there. It's going to return everything. If you put false there, it's not going to return anything. So yeah. this is a Boolean value. A Boolean is a yes, no, true, false type of value. Yep. And that's what it's looking for. Now, the data type of created by, well, that's a complex type. So we have to say dot email. That gives us a single line of text. How do we, you know, we're comparing two things. How do we get at what? what is it that's returning a Boolean? And I actually learned this from you, Kurt. This little thing right here, the equal sign or a greater than, less than, you know, there's there's quite a few of them. They're called operators. The op, the equal sign operator is what's giving us a Boolean value. It's either equal this or it's not equal this. 
That's right. So if you're wondering, what kind of thing should I put here? Well, you need to come up with a Boolean. So I love the fact that you brought that up. Needs to be a Boolean value for that to work. Very good. Anything else out of that, Kurt? Um, well, just one more thing since you said what you said. So that <laughs> equal sign, that equal sign operator in the deep dark recesses of power apps, what what returns a value? What returns one value? A function. Remember that. A function returns one value. So in the deep dark recesses of power apps, that equal sign is actually an operator function. It's actually a it's, it's actually a function, you know, that we you know, we just see the left and right, but that's true. That's yeah. interesting. I like it. Just trivia. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this screen because I'm going to start ripping things out. <laughs> That's ripped out. I don't need a drop down list yet. This all the way across. Um, all right. So we, we covered that now. I didn't want to make the, make this video about search and filter. I mean, filter is the most used thing that you're going to do with that data source. And then the, what I recommend that you do sort on the very end. Okay. And you also have sort by columns. Now you can nest all these, these functions, filter, search, sort, but don't think so sort, you can only sort on one column. And I, sometimes I see people using nested sorts, thinking that they're going to sort on this field and then it's going to sort on this. Nope, you can't do that. I did that. I did that. I <laughs> wow, didn't understand did that. that you couldn't do that, right? Then when you said that, I still didn't agree with it. I said, yeah. let me think about it. And finally, it dawned on me. Oh, my goodness, you can't do that. So uh, sort by columns is pretty important. Pretty <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you want to sort on multiple columns, let's say we've got um, – a large organization um, and we've got all of the employees in there or even customers. And we say, okay, I want to look at the list and I want to want them sorted by their last name. Okay. And, and those two fields are separate. Sometimes people put them in there together and that's not granular granular. You want first name over here and the last name over here, because you might want to do separate sorts on that. But if we want to sort and we've got like a thousand Smiths, well, within that, how do we want to sort? Well, then we want to sort on the first name. Okay. In order to do that, you're going to use that sort by columns. Um, if and you, you can sort on all kinds of stuff. If you didn't and you try to do a nested sort, you would sort all the last names, but then you would just get another sort of all the first names. <laughs> so, yeah, doesn't do anything. Yeah. So uh, here, if I said sort... I could try to search on when it was created, maybe. There's created. That's a date time type of value. And then I'll say, I want to see the most recent records at the top and go down into the past as, as we move down. So I would say sort order dot descending. Okay. And then let's say a bunch of records have the same, like they were created on the same day. Well, then I might want to sort on something else. I'm going to click on format text and it messes, messed everything up, didn't it? So I guess I'll have to do my own indentation here. Okay, there we go. So instead of, of building, like uh, doing another one for another column, you'd want to use sort by column. So I just wanted to mention that. Um... So that's the item. So guys, if you have anything that, uh, any questions over that topic, please let me know in the, in the chat there. I'm trying to keep an eye on, on everything as I'm going along. Kurt, are we ready for the default property? This yeah, is a vital is, property. Go ahead. Vital. And it's, and for me, it's the hardest one to use. You got to You got to make sure you, you, you know how to do this. This is good stuff right here. Okay. Now I sorted this on a in a in a weird way, so it's all jumbled up, right? Mm -hmm. But um, okay, so in order to talk about default, okay, there's something that I want to do here, and it's a little bit of a tip and a trick, uh, to and it will sort of assist us explaining the default, okay? And I do this with almost every single gallery I use, so I've got the gallery selected in the tree view. 
and I'm going to go in here and go look at the template fill. Now we already set the template fill. It's white. Yeah. Okay. But right I, there. okay. What I want to do here is use an if statement. Okay. And what I want to say is this item dot is selected. If it is selected, I want to say color dot light yellow. I already know that's the color I really like for that. Okay, look at that. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> so now when I select a row, you can see that it's selected. And if that's too, if, if uh, maybe you or some of your users might be a little colorblind, well, what we could do is we just take that light word out of there and then it becomes like really obvious <laughs> which one is selected, right? So we just cover at least two other things here, okay? So before I talk about default, we really needed to understand um, we've got this item. So I'm going to cut that, put that up here. Now, the this item keyword within Power Apps, if I go back to my formula, this item, this item is a keyword that you can use within Power Apps, and that's going to reference the item that you're currently on, okay? And that doesn't mean selected, okay? What I could do, like if I click on, let's say this this first record here for a moment. Do you see here on this label it says this item dot id? That doesn't mean like I could I could click on a different record and this this item each record will have a this item that's being referenced. It just means whatever record we're currently on. Okay, so for each record here we're displaying the id. So that's what the this item is used for, and the only place I've seen this item you used is inside of a gallery okay, within the template, this mm -hmm. item. Now, what comes after this item? Well, you're going to get at all of the database fields that the gallery is based on, okay, that the template is based on, with an addition of one more, pro uh, one more thing called is selected. That's something that Power Apps adds to every data source that you bind to a gallery. So keep that in mind. Is it selected? Now with a gallery, only one that only one can be selected. Uh, now I was hoping that uh, we'll have time to go over how can we have multiple selections in a gallery because it's it's possible, but we've got to do a little bit of an out of the box thinking to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, also keep in mind there's there's another property in here called something like allow, what multiple is that property? Multiple selection, right? No, selectable, look at this, selectable. There's a property called selectable and you can change this to false, which means nothing's gonna be selected. Now, I didn't know about this until we started looking at this. Now think about that, that's pretty good. You can actually control, keep the user from selecting things if you need to. Yeah, isn't that like cool? It. Yeah. So if they were to click on this, it would do some type of database operation or take something that would that would take five minutes. You know, let's say we got a, a button down here and if you didn't have a spinner on top of this, you know, and if they're clicking on all kinds of different stuff, they could be right. making the app crash, to be honest. Right. You know? right. So in that case, you might want to use that. Now, how I found about it, somebody brought their app to me like, hey, this isn't working. And I'm like, I couldn't figure it out. And I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> And I found this selectable. What is that? Oh, and they had it set to um, to false. I'm like, oh, and then it fixed it. So that's forever etched in my mind that that's there. Yeah. Um, so we've got uh, this item as a is selected. Okay. Um, hoping not to repeat anything here. Well, we do have gallery dot selected, um, but this is um, a little different. Is selected. Okay, so this item, I should say here, refers to the underlying record in question, not necessarily the selected record or row. Okay, um, it's in effect on every single row, to be honest. Okay. 
So this item.id is what the the um, example that I used to display that. Okay, so that it refers to the underlying data. So we could say this item dot field name. Then we have the um, is selected that is off of this. So we, this item dot, we'll get these two things. But there's a third thing in here, Kurt. Can you think of anything else that we can access with this item? Um, you got is selected. You got selected. Well, okay. So let's. Uh, let's, let's item dot selected. Dot. This so item dot selected would be the whole record, right? Okay. Yeah, if we're inside, and and I know that you know the answer to this because we were talking about this before. So when we, if we're inside of the template or we're inside of, let's say, a label or something, and we oh, say this okay. item dot, yeah. we can get at the data, we can get at yeah. if it's selected or not. But there's a third thing, and it's huge that some people right. don't even think about. Right. You know. So so if you were to na name your label something that was meaningful, you would be able to say <laughs> this item dot meaningful name. <laughs> So I could look at, uh, we'll talk about meaningful, na unmeaningful names, label, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, so the, the this item, I'm gonna say is selected just for a moment. And, and also I'm gonna make a copy of this label, okay? So we're inside of a label and we've got this item. And we could say is selected like we did on that other thing. So true, false, right? And then we got all the fields, which we've seen, but we also have, Label, it's not allowing me to reference that now, Kurt. Is this item dot selected, dude. Th this item dot selected. Well, this item is referring to the template. So, um, see, there's no select now. Now, if we're talking about a gallery, oh, a gallery okay. has a selected property, right? I think that's what we're, we're trying to do. It's, can you put the gallery name in that? Um, give me, give me just one second here. Mm -hmm. Let me add in. Because this is actually, this is something I use all the time. Yeah. Toggle. And maybe we want to use this toggle for something. We can make it invisible. But I want this toggle to be dependent upon this label. Okay. So let's get, let's do what you you mentioned. LBL uh, selected. Okay. So over here in the toggle, I can set up the default property to be LBL Look at that. Now it's giving me, oh, now it's showing me these controls. Isn't that funny? <laughs> LBL selected. So now I can reference a, but I didn't do this item. Okay. Um, so I guess the, this item, you can reference that within the current row, but the this item doesn't do that. Try to, try to do the gallery name right there. Just, 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 just to appease me. Okay. Dot, now what do you want me to do? Dot selected. Dot. Now, do we uh, have a label? It? Yep, there it is. Dot text equals true. Now realize this is a um, a toggle, and it's it wants a boolean value, right? So, what were you what were you trying to to do here? Um, the well, problem I thought you were just trying to re reference the, the the name. I thought that's what you were trying to do, the reference the label. Well, the problem with that is when we say gallery.selected, it's only going to give us one, and it's going to be the same one for all the records. Oh, okay. You okay. see that? I, I'm sorry. I didn't know that that's what – okay. I didn't understand your exercise. Um, So if you want to reference something within that row, then we'll have to just say yeah, that label – X equals true. There you go. You see that? And if we had reference gallery.selected, well, we're always going to be looking at that, whichever one is selected every time. Um, now, what I have done with this is you could have a for all that will go through a gallery and we can reference uh, the controls inside of it, you know? Right. Now, one th one thing we could do with that too is we could do an add columns to the source and call it uh, have an is selected column in that, and then and then every time you click on the selection with your toggle, it would change that source to is selected. And then you could say this item, that label would equal this item's dot is selected, if you wanted mm. to do something like that. <clears throat>
that would be kind of cool. Uh, controls can be ref referenced, but not with the this item. Yeah. So I'll, I'll make that distinction there. Okay. So we talked about is selected. Now I wonder if we can talk about default. Um, okay, I've got an idea. We've got IDs here. So let's put in a text input at the top, and we're only going to allow them to put in numbers here. And I'm going to say 0, 0. And there is no record with, with a 0 in it. Okay, but that's what will make the default. So I'm going to click on the gallery and we'll go to default. Now, what is default? The default property is the record or row or, or template instance in that gallery that you want to have selected for the user by default. You think that was a good description? How would you describe it? Because I want people to really understand this. I, Go. I, I'm i not sure what you were saying really yet. Oh, I don't, okay. Okay. So I was a little confused by it. Okay. So we need to give the default property a record. Okay. And a lot of times what I have in the default property is a lookup. I just want right. to give it a single right. record. Okay. That's and right. that's what we, so I'll say lookup. What do I want to uh, search for? Well, I don't want to go do a lookup on the whole data source because inside of that gallery, we might have a subset of the full data source. So what I'll say here is gallery one dot all items. So that's going to give me a result set. It's going to give me a table value, rows and columns inside of that gallery that are being displayed there. Okay. So that's good. So the first parameter of a lookup is going to be a data source or a table value like that. It could be a collection. The second one is going to be the criteria. And what I want to do is I want to get the record that has the ID of whatever number that was input by the user up here at the top. So let's give this a meaningful name. We'll say txt ID to select. Okay. So I'm going to grab that name now. And I'm going to say dot text. That's the property within the text box or the text entry. Now, ID is numeric value. It's an auto number. And this, whatever, even though they're typing numbers in a, in a text input, well, that's going to be a string. So in order to turn that into a number, because if we don't turn it into a number, um, you, you see it says incompatible types for comparison. Well, we need to put value in. So let's go ahead and run this. And I see there's one called, uh, that has an ID of 52. So I'm going to say 52. Oh, look at that. What do you think of that, Kurt? I love it. I love it. What's really cool about this is if you are on another another screen and you are changing, uh, you were changing something on another screen, you need to go back to that with that value. You can go back to that default and use that default. Absolutely. And one idea that you had today, Kurt, was to cover deep linking. This is where, this is something that you'll need to know if you ever do deep linking. I don't want to go into the topic very much there, but we could set this up to look at the parameter that was passed into the app and we could automatically select that record. Um, so I've got a, I thought this might be uh, fun to do, Kurt. We got a slider here and we'll, for the max, we can set this up to be Gallery one dot uh, what record count? Um, we have all items count. There we go. Yep. All right. Now, so we've got now, the, now, now the problem with that, just want to throw that out there, is the mm -hmm. all items count is only going to give you what how many has been rendered. It's not going to give you everything that you've selected in that gallery yet. So you have to be aware of that. Yeah. That's a that's an important distinction there, Kurt. I'm I'm going to document that. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about the items count. Could be used, but only going to whoop, going 
to give you the count on the rendered items, not necessarily all of them. So yeah. typically a gallery will sh go, it will actually be displaying the first 100. It, it's, it's almost like it goes, gets a hundred at a time. Yeah. So in that case, if we had, a, a, you know, several thousand here and we try to reference all items count, it's only going to give us a hundred perhaps. Okay. Um, there is one exception to that I found. If you make the gallery have the, uh, you know, that wrap count, uh, we could have, more, if you're displaying more than a hundred on the screen at once without any use of scroll bars, it will go ahead and get, I don't know if it gets the 200 or, or if it gets the 110 or whatever to actually give you the, all the data to be displayed there. Um, so the if you want I, the question I have about that, Darren is if I were to scroll to the bottom and then back up to the top, would it give me, would that be the, the, it, it changed the amount that got rendered. Let's say if I had a thousand records in there and I yeah. scroll to the bottom, would that be the way it works? I, I believe at that point, um, if you, you sort of force it to, to render it all. Okay. Um, so for example, if I go to screen three, I'm going to go back in time until we have the data where we've got a lot of data. Right. And what I'm going to do here to sort of find this out, give you the absolute truth of the value of, of how this is handled. I'm going to get the name of the gallery. I'm going to go in here and say gallery dot all items count. It's giving me 5,000. Now I'm wondering, it's, it's only displaying nine, but it gave me 5,000. It could be now, a memory. Because it's, I'm sorry, what? It could be a memory thing too, because you don't have much in the memory. Right there, right. That's what I was about to say. Yeah, because we're using a, a collection there. Maybe it's it's during it all. But yeah, if, if you scroll down to the top, and if you're working with a data source, um, I, I I believe that you're practically forcing it to render everything. Yeah. Um, I don't recommend displaying that much data on a screen no. <laughs> for a user. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if we were going to do this um, the way that it's always going to give us the, the true uh, value. Um, we've got record count. And we'll say all items. <clears throat> okay. Uh, did I do that right? Is that count? Count rows. Count rows. Okay, very good. And that gives us 79. So let's go back to that screen um, and, and try that just for a second here. So we got 5,000. What happens if we were to uh, use count rows here? Um, and I imagine since I scrolled to the bottom, it's going to get us everything. Um, so I'll say all items. And this is 5,000. Maybe we can um, unload and reload it and see if those are both the same later. Um, all right, so we got the max there. And what I was going to say, we got the slider. Instead of having them type something in there, we could go into the default and say slider.value. Wouldn't this be cool? You know how in Access, you've got this thing where you got like, okay, give me the next the next page of like you're pa paginating through the stuff or you say, Hey, go to the end, you know? Yeah. Show me the, the, so you sort of creating your own scroll bar in a way, if this was sorted, um, ascendingly here, let's go to, um, <clears throat> let's say ID and we'll say ascending. Now it's sorted. If I, I click on this, and we got a lot of data in here. This would be an easy way. Instead of, like, let's say you don't want to use a scroll bar. You can turn the scroll bar off, guys, of the gallery. It's called show scroll bar. So you could turn that off and effectively have your own slider here. And you're like, well, I don't like a horizontal uh, slider. Well, go in here and change it to a vertical. And then put it on the side of the gallery. You've got your own little scroll bar that 
maybe looks nicer. I don't know. You tell me. Does it look... <laughs> do you like this better than the? Well, you got you have control over what you want to do. You can control the step and everything else. You know how far you want to scroll for each time you move it. Yeah. It sounds kind of cool. It's kind of neat. I like to have my own. One of these days, we'll be able, you can build a component and have your own uh, scroll bar in it. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. So, Kurt, do you feel like I, I, uh, or we covered the default proper, uh, the default property I have, properly? <laughs> I have one question that that you did not answer, and that is, yes. um, what happens if the lookup returns fault? Re, doesn't re, it returns a blank? What happens mm. then? Does it just go to the top, and if it can't find it, that's a that's a great question. Um, so let's let's try this out. Um. Well, of course, the slider is always going to be g give us a, a value that's valid. But let's say on the max, let's add one to it. So I know there's one value there that's not going to be valid at all. So I'm gonna go all the way there. So you see that I set it to 80 and there's only 79 in there. It's going to select the first one. Looks like to me. So could you could you go to the sixth one and click it? Click the sixth item real quick. And then sure. put in the number uh, 1, 000, 10, 000 in, in the uh, text box label there that you have. Because that's, you had that set to that, didn't you? Where you could put a number no, in it's, it? No, it's set up to the slider. Okay, okay. But would, going to 80 would be the same thing as 10,000. Okay. there's. But we could, I, I wonder, let's say 10,000 there. Does that have any effect? So if I go all the way over to 10,000, it's still going to give me that first. It goes up the top then. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Um, oh, this is an interesting question here. Um, it's a little off topic, but it's something I can answer quickly. And do you have any resources for power apps that can help me walk through building a Gantt chart with galleries? Isn't that a, uh, an interesting question there, Kurt? You know, Dave, David's online with us um, today and he would know what we're talking about because basically that scheduling thing that we did for him is like a Gantt chart, isn't it? We could build a Gantt chart the same way, right? Yeah. That's kind of smooth, man. So guys, if you go to my channel and then click on the live tab, which one was that? It was tracking tasks with time boxing. And that's effectively what, what we came up with there. What's funny is, Kurt, there's only 818 views. You think people would uh, really like that because that's type of material that I, I don't think you, you see everywhere, you know? No, no. But, and, you know, really that timesheet isn't exactly a Gantt chart. We could build, we could make a video on that one day. Uh, we should maybe do a video on how to build a Gantt chart, which is putting values in there, right? Um, might be kind of cool. I'm going to try to go to the end and sort of show you what we came up with at the end here. And uh, it was near the end. I, I think there for a while you were wondering if if I was going to come up with something that was actually going to work or not. Uh, you told me well, that this, I, I surprised you. I think there was one place in here that, yeah, yeah, definitely we were struggling with the um, the thing there. You did a good job coming up with it, though. I think you were throwing me on the bus a couple times in there, too. So. What? Yeah, I'm not a bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, you're 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 applauding me there. That's when I knew I did something right. Look at that. <laughs> look at that. Elvis, Elvis was applauding me too. <laughs> and the crowd was going, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I am Sonoma says, could you show linking to galleries? Absolutely. Um, where are we at in here? Uh, we need to, we need to get through this, Kurt. We're yeah. I just, I just want to put out there real quick that in our, uh, PPC videos, we have some really good, uh, video content about the conditional getting into galleries and selecting and toggles. Um, so like, cause Amber was asking to walk through that again. And I just wanted to point out that, um, we've got some really good content out there in uh, PPC. Um, absolutely and if, if you guys uh are, are wondering we did a live stream earlier in the week called something about 747 so we're actually running a special where we include a laptop as well as the ticketing system of course as well as the jumpstart kit 
I, you know, and I, I said PPC and really this isn't, uh, yeah, it's not personal protection or anything. It's personal pocket coaching is what it is. Um, and what that is, it's a video in your mailbox every day and it's, and it's a co covering, covering some topic on power apps and yeah. programming like power apps. So, yeah, absolutely. So we got the default. We're usually going to use a lookup there. We've talked about all items count gallery dot selected. Okay. So this is where we're going to start um, linking to the gallery. Okay. So I'm going to go back to design mode and try to zoom in and out here so I can uh, work with this a little better. And you know, this is, this is a, a, a great transition here, Kurt, because we could just add in a, a text input here and we could allow them to modify values and then have maybe have a button here that will patch it. We could do that. Okay, so um, inside this text box, for the default, we could reference gallery one dot selected, whichever record is selected. Now at this point, we can get at those fields and we can get at the labels and the toggles. And if it's, um, of course, we already know it's selected because we said gallery.selected. But uh, let's look at title. So if I run this, if I click on accident reporting, look, accident reporting. That's how you link a control to the gallery. Talked about all items count, gallery that's selected. Um, what about show navigation? So if you look at this, there's like a this little button that maybe you've seen with a gallery, maybe not. This is the navigation that they're showing that they're talking about. Yeah. So yep. you can use a scroll bar, you can do something like this. Um, yep. Yep. you know, actually, I need to put it way down because we have it at 10,000 right now. There's a different way of navigating, or you can use these little buttons. Okay, so how do you get those little buttons in a gallery? We go down and it's called show navigation. And by, def by default, it's off or, or false. Okay, and if you want to turn off your um, scroll bar, you can put a false there and you'd be hiding that. Okay. And there's a, there's a sister property to that, and that is the uh, um, navigation step. If you look at that, you can set how many times that you're going to, how many rows you're going to move every time you move, click on that. Really? So it's, it, it's set to one and you can set that to say five, you know? Oh, wow. Look at that pebble snatching. I didn't know that. Wow. You, so, you asked me to investigate it. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So does it work with the scroll bar as well or just the navigation stuff? I think it's the navigation. Yeah, I mean, if you click some, so a scroll bar, you, uh, my screen is really small. Sometimes in Power Apps, other people's app, Power Apps, I see a, a much thicker scroll bar there. Um, and maybe it's controlled by the system or the browser level settings. But um, if you click on a part of the scroll bar that isn't the little handle there, it should be scrolling like a page at a time. So right. yeah, it seems like that would... You know, I might want to move that. So how many rows do we have here? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what I might do here is put in a value of eight. Yeah. We look at a like a page at a time. That's that's so that's cool. All right. Kind of neat. Kind of neat. Navigation stuff. Hey guys, we're learning all kinds of stuff here. We are. Navigation stuff. Now, parent dot template. Okay, this is some really good stuff. This is stuff that you really need to know. All right, you ready for this? So, um, I do this almost with any. Every time I use a gallery, I'm in here doing this. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Um, well, I'm going to run this, and this is an easy way of scrolling up to the top. <laughs> That's what I needed to do. Um, so I've got all these controls here and sometimes, you know, you'll have a label like this and you'll have this label like down here and they're not 
quite a line and it looks ugly, you know? Well, what you might want to end up doing here for a label, let's say the we, you can set the Y to zero, which is typically what I do for all these controls. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to select all the controls that I see here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make them all have a, a Y of zero. Put them all the way to the top. And now what I want to do is manipulate the height and make it dynamic. Absolutely. I want it to be the exact height of the row. So I'm going to say parent dot uh, template height. Now you don't want to say parent dot height. What's that going to give you? That's going to give you the full height of this gallery, which is a lot more than just one of them, right? And it's given us a value of 53. Okay. Now, if you had something else, you want to take up the full span of the gallery let's say for a second um this particular label let's say i want to take up the the full width of the gallery um uh, or the rest of it okay so what i would do is i would go into width which is set to 500 i would say parent template width now you see that it hangs off of there a little bit mm -hmm. You don't want that because this text could be like going out here <laughs> and could be uh, giving you some bad stuff, right? Um, so what you want to do is subtract self. Self is a keyword that references whatever control that you're in, okay? So right now you see we're editing the width property. The width property of what? Of a label. So we're referencing the label that we're currently on. Self dot X. X. We'll take the full width of the gallery minus how much over the, the X offset that it was sitting at. And it gives us the full width of that. Yeah. I just want to encourage everybody to get really good at that kind of thing, because if you're dealing with responsive apps or anything that's going to be conditionally uh, moved around makes that way you want to be able to be very aware of X and Y and moving stuff around. I uh, uh, like the, like the bouncing ball, right? Um, bouncing ball. Another cool thing, Darren, that you you're doing right here. By, by setting all these to the template height. Now, yeah. if you're sitting here looking at this and you want to make some adjustments to your gallery because you're saying, well, you know what? I want to, I want to add a couple, I want to get another row in there. Or maybe it's coming, my rows are cut, cut, cutting off at the halfway point. So I want to adjust my template height just a little bit. That's now, true. if you just adjust the template height, you don't have to adjust all the other controls again. If you if you didn't yeah. do that, you would have to every time you adjusted the template height, you'd have to you have to fool with every control that you had in that template, you know. So that's a that that's the the neatness of what you're doing right there. I think. Um, so you're, you're telling me, Kurt, if I went into template size for the gallery and I change this to a hundred, if we reference that dynamically, things will look right, even if that changes, right? That's right. That's right. Everything except that toggle. The toggle needs a little bit of love and attention. It does. I wonder what's going on with that. I wonder why. Why didn't that? Probably, okay. So what I did was I made the um, the height to be dynamic, and and the width isn't really set. Now, if I made the width to be twice that, okay. So this hmm. is something else dynamic we could do. We could say self dot height, and that would be a perfect square. But if you want it to sort of sort of take up the full space, we would have multiplied that by two. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That, okay. I didn't know that. Okay. So see, this is another one that you, you've learned by uh, the burn. That's something that you've learned from the yeah. burn on, you know. <laughs> but you let's know, say you need to write a book and call it everything I've learned from the burn, you know, and just all these little things like this, you know, that you don't even think about. It, it wouldn't perform well with SEO, but – <laughs> After they read it, they're like, okay, now I get the title. <laughs> um, so in a realistic app, okay, we probably wouldn't want the toggle to behave like this, right? No. So we no. might want to say, well, I, I just want the toggle to take up half the, the space of the height, the template height. So I might multiply this by 0. 0.5. And then always so that, centered, and then always centered in the height, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just give me a second here. Um, so, so the toggle is a little weird. It's not a perfect square. Okay, so we're messing with the the width here. 
I almost want the width to always be twice that of the height. So let's let's work with the height for a moment. And we say, well, we only want this to be half of it. Okay. Okay, that looks about right. Maybe a little less, maybe 35%. Okay. And then what we want to do is we want to center it vertically, right? Yeah. So is this what you were talking about? Yeah. How would we do that, Kurt? Well, we would take the 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 the, the height of the, the template height. Okay, we have it right here. Minus the height of the, the toggle. Okay, so you want me to do it right here on this property, or is it another property you had in mind? Um, right. No, no. It, yeah, minus self.height. Yeah, I'm sorry. Minus self.height. You're on the toggle. Minus self.height. Divided by two. Divided by two. Now, and keep in mind, sure we're in height. What's that? And make sure you put some parentheses in there. Am I in the right spot? Um, I think maybe what you meant to to uh, the property that you, that in order to do this would be the Y, right? Oh, you, right. I thought you were. I can't see. Okay, there we go. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah I want so, the Y position to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for the Y, we want to say self.height. <laughs> I right. thought you were already in the Y. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So what we want to do is say parent dot uh, template height, and yep. then we will subtract self dot height. We put pr some parentheses around that. We'll divide it by two. There you go. Yeah. And that's actually a formula you taught me for a lot of cool stuff. And and I'm like thinking that's, that's, that is suspect that formula right there, guys, that especially my accelerator students, <laughs> that is suspect to go in a function. That is suspect. Oh. So we could have a center, yeah. center, center vertical and center uh, horizontal of any any control, maybe yeah. perhaps. You know? Yeah. You pass in this number and this number. And inside yeah. the formula, we'll do the divide by two and it will put it in those parentheses. So now you never have to remember the formula. Exactly. Cool. I like that, Kurt. Exactly. We should do I like that. it. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So Going back over to our list of properties. So we talked about template width and height. Now there's a template padding. So I'll just go ahead and mention that parent uh, template padding. Okay. And we use that at the very beginning of the video. I, I told you guys, I like a padding of two, you know, wrap count. We talked about that. Um, yeah. We talked about that. So a template size, that's how much space the each row will take up depending upon horizontal or vertical, right? Nick saying people uh, pay big money for this. <laughs> um, yeah, there's the template padding, template padding there. Uh, we've talked about all items. What about transitions? We talked about that. Yep. We, Kurt, we've talked about all the vital properties. Yeah, we, we actually are covering some really good ground here. Sometimes on these live streams, we get going into these rabbit holes and we don't get done near what we want. We're actually getting things done today. This is this is great stuff. You guys are going to be very well versed on the gallery by the time we're done here, if you're not already. And that's why I named it everything you wanted to know about a gallery. Um, so here we got these tips and tricks. Highlight the selected row. We've done that. Reference controls as if there were fields. We talked about that. We talked about toggles. Now, Curtis, is there anything you want to add to that toggle thing? Because I think you either yeah. uncover or you help somebody with toggles inside of a gallery. Yeah, there's 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 something about that. You're you might be tempted to to switch. There's there's a couple of important properties. You got the toggle default property, and if you have that set to false, it's always going to revert to false, and then you have to click it again. So so oftentimes you want to have a toggle associated with something that's going to be um, some some like right now in the gallery you're actually in a you're showing a table. Okay. Mm -hmm. The toggle is usually referencing something inside of that. Like you got, you want it to be selected. Maybe you want it to be selected. So you would have to have a field in there called is selected or some kind of selected field in there. And you want to, you don't want to change that field to be true. Like let's say if you selected it to be true, if toggled, you set the toggle to true, you might be tempted to go into these properties called check and uncheck or um, uh, what is it? Un, I think it's check or uncheck, isn't it? We got um, on change. On check, on select, and on, and on four of them. 
Right. So you might be tempted to put change that in the on check or the on uncheck when you're referencing a table. OK, now outside of this gallery, outside of tables, that on check and on uncheck are probably pretty important properties. But when you're messing with a gallery and you're messing with the underlying data that's attached to that gallery, do not do not ever, ever, ever use those 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 properties. OK, go to the gallery select. And then you can reference that that toggle that's been selected the, through through the gallery, the gallery dot selected. In this case, it would be gallery one dot selected dot toggle. Reference that, and if it's true, set your is selected true. And if it's false, set your is selected field, the underlying field that's in the data source. Set that to true or false. And now, in the default property of your toggle, you would set that to the data sources dot is selected. Okay. Yeah, and maybe we could um, devote uh, a separate session to this, but you just made me realize we forgot one really vital property, and it's probably to be expected for people like you and me, Kurt, because any property that starts with on, we think yeah. that that's not a property, that's an event. Right. But in Power right. Apps, everything's a property. They mix oh events goodness. and properties together. So anything that starts with an on is actually an event type of property. So you've got imperative code in any property that starts with on and everything else is declarative what so do what you is, guys what, what is imperative code what are you talking about what is that word imperative uh imperative code means that you can do something okay think of functions like navigate launch notify back patch these are like you're going to take actions right but you have declarative type of things like the, the fill color, right? That's declarative. I'd say most things are declarative in, in nature within Power Apps. Um, so, yeah. And, and with and one of the big differences, sometimes people don't know when to put a semicolon and where not to put a semicolon. Well, you can use semicolons to break up lines of code in an imperative property. You do not use semicolons in declarative. The declarative, you're setting a single value. With imperative, you got a block of code, baby. <laughs> right, right. I'm going to adjust good my stuff. camera here. Yeah, good explanation, man. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to say here was um, whenever something is clicked on within a gallery, and you want something to happen based on that? When I first started with Power Apps, I'm like, oh, I need to select the template. So I'm trying, no, that's the label. Oh, that's a label. How can I get at that thing? So I go over here in the tree view and I click on the gallery. No, I'm not, I need, I need the, the, have you ever done that, Kurt? Like I'm trying to get at the underlying template. There, there's been so many times I need your help. Darren, help. And then you would come in and do this and fix this for me. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to mess up this dynamic cool thing I did up here. So maybe what I should do is make a, a copy. Just in case. I'm going to make this file available to you guys. And uh, so I go in here. And uh, I, I move this. And this is what I would do. I would try to click on the template. So here I haven't selected any control within the gallery. I just selected that first record, which is the template. And it was here, I'd say, okay, now that I have the template selected, now I can go to on select and then write my code. And it took me forever to realize, oh, all you got to do is just click on gallery and it's the same thing. <laughs> the thing would drive me nuts. So just realize you just click on the gallery, go to on select, and you can put your imperative code right there. So just by you talking about the the uh, the toggle stuff there. Um now, so this is this is imperative code that we can have. And what you said, Kurt, is you might be tempted to put code, imperative code, in on change, on check, on select, on uncheck. But what you just told everybody is, hey, don't do that. You can mess some things up, especially if you've got some, uh, you know, patching code or something. Well, the default can change the value. So if you put stuff in on change and that gallery goes to get data and it changes it, boom, you just made that code run again. Have you guys like, ever seen a toggle in a gallery? Have you ever seen your toggle? You'll, you'll run your program and your toggles are just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's like, what is it doing? 
Well, that's that's what's happening is you're doing a bunch of clicking and stuff inside of there when you put that in there. So you got to take that stuff out of that on changing, on unchanged. And, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out here because people pay big money for this. This silly. is a big deal. Just silly. You yeah. let's say we've got a patch or we've got an update or a remove or whatever code in that toggle and that default is just making it go boom 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 what's going on if you're touching date if you're calling apis you're talking to sql server you're talking to that sharepoint list it just goes back and forth back and forth back and forth and you're like what's going on that's weird i'm you know i'm gonna go for lunch i'll come back you come back you've used up all of your api do you guys realize you only have oh, so wow. much api usage to use wow. did you know that wow i, I never thought out. of that i found out on my on my denver project and it was very, it was painful. I learned a lot of painful lessons. I, I learned from the burn, Kurt. <laughs> People pay big money for this. I, I had to, I had to lose a lot of time and, and money and effort learning it. You know, I never, I never thought of that. If you let that thing going back and forth like that for long, you're going to get throttled. They're going to throttle you down. Yeah. It's all on Azure and you're not paying for some server usage. So you, if you call, SharePoint list and query it a thousand times within a minute. Um, they might say, "Up, oh, you can only use so many thousands within a minute," and then it will throttle you back. And uh, you'll get in there, and even if people are using the app, they'll be like, "Hey, what's going on?" I mean, we're talking like it takes like ten minutes for something to come up on the screen for everybody. Like, oh, what's going on? You, you know, you know that conversation right there that you just had could be and people maybe need to pay attention to what you just said because a lot of times we complain about our power apps being so slow and the way we design them they're so slow maybe what's happening is we're being throttled because of the way things are being designed and and that's going to slow you you think anything's going to slow your app down being throttled is really going to slow your app down oh yeah it's very painful uh, your manager's upset your clients are upset everybody's upset they think power apps is junk your name is mud I mean, it just go. It's just a bad. It's going to be a bad day for you until you get that figured out. They might forget it, but it depends on how long it goes. That's true. That's true. Especially if their first impression of Power Apps, like you convince everybody your organization, Power Apps is the best thing since sliced bread. Just let me at, let me get it. Let me create an app. Let me create an app. And you set it up wrong. That's their first impression of Power Apps. Like yep. that's a and, joke. And you it's all that. because. And it's all because you changed the data source from within the on check or on and check. Just one line, just you put it in the wrong property and you screwed the whole thing up. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Learn, learn from the burn. Yeah. You're, you're either gonna you're either gonna hear it now or you're gonna learn from the burn. I hope that you can hear it now, guys. <laughs> we'll right back. Hold on. Okay. Well, one important thing I'm gonna mention uh, while uh, Kurt is taking a little break there is if you click on a control like a label or a button or something. A label's got an on select. Look at this, select parent, okay, select parent. So if I go in and parent is what? The parent is the gallery, okay? So I'm gonna say notify and I'm gonna say on select, I'm gonna say this item dot ID. I'll say title, how about that, title. So every time somebody clicks on a row, boom, advanced building certificate. Well, that's not right. <laughs> we'll go back down. Okay, so this is the first one. Ac accident investigation. So if I click on the second one, accident reporting, okay, I think my um, default property sort of messed things up for me initially. Okay, so why I did that notify is to show that the on select code is being run whenever anything's clicked on. So if you look at these labels that we drop down on our gallery inside the template, they always had this select parent. Now, what happens if we took that out? Okay, what's going to happen now if I click on this label? it doesn't fire the parent selected event. Okay. But if I could, but if you have, if you have a label there and it calls parent.select, it is going to call that code. 
So when Kurt says, hey, you don't want to put things inside the event for this toggle a lot of times. And, you know, when you're working with a, a toggle inside of a gallery. Um, so for the on select, oh, look at this. It's already there. Select parent. Yeah. Okay. So if you ever find that your on select property doesn't work on your gallery, make sure that all your controls in here have that select parent. Yep. I don't know. I bet there was at least a half a dozen times when I was first learning this power apps, I'd be calling Darren and he'd have to go in on zoom with me to, to put that on select in there for me because I didn't know, I didn't understand that. Um, but you know, you, so, and, and it's not apparent, right? It's not apparent. You're just clicking around and you can't figure out why this thing isn't working. It's just, you know, there's no, there's no apparent reason. And, but that's it. That's yeah. exactly what it is. You just got to put that on select in there. Absolutely. Or the select, I'm sorry, select parent. Um, so we've talked about highlight selected row. We've talked about toggles. We've talked about default multiple row selections. Now I'm starting to wonder, Kurt, I'm, I'm just looking at the time here. Um, we might need to break this up into a, a second, uh, live yeah. stream because we've got tons to cover here. Yeah. I want to talk about records. Like, like, like when you select an item from the gallery, what, what you can get, create a variable and carry that entire record that you selected over to a different screen and stuff, you know? So I want, I, I, there's so yeah. much that we want to do. We want to be able to update tables, especially like SharePoint. A lot of people are, a lot of people are using SharePoint. You know, I was told that 70% of customers um, that need, need work done are SharePoint uh, customers. So, yeah. you know, you guys might need to learn this stuff, man, the SharePoint. Absolutely. Um <laughs> And a lot of times, Kurt, I, I don't know if I've, I've ever told you this, but a lot of times in a live stream, I've got like six things I'm, I'm, I'm controlling. I'm controlling the live stream and controlling this tablet yeah. that's streaming on TikTok. I, yeah. I'm looking at the comments, the private chat, this. I'm thinking about what you're saying. I'm thinking about what I'm saying, where I'm going to go, this thing. So sometimes when you share, even it could be like the best thing you've ever said to me ever <laughs> in my life. And my response will be, very good, yeah. Kurt. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about so I never want you to think, I, I mean, I, I am with you, but, but I'm also, I can, my brain's yeah. juggling things and well, it doesn't um, do well. Sometimes when I say something out of my mouth, everybody's going, yeah, Kurt. Yeah, whatever. Let's go on to the next thing. Um, but, but look, I, you know, I just want to say, man, I don't know how you do it. I've seen you, I've been watching you do this. I'm sure that other people that are watching this, um, you guys just don't realize how hard that is. Darren's actually asked me to run a live stream before, and I refuse because there's no possible way I could do like he does. I mean, it's just amazing how much he's bouncing around, sharing screens. I'm interrupting him in the middle of all that. He's changing everything around. And and, and, and I don't do well with interruptions. No, he hates it. He hates it. But he's, he muffles that somehow. So It makes my brain short circuit. <laughs> Yeah, it it's just amazing. Yeah, how he processes is a little bit different than 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 some of us uh, mere mortals. So, um, I just I just want to say that I'm in, I just can't get over. I, I always call him the F sixteen fighter pilot because I'm I could just imagine being an F sixteen fighter pilot having to do that and being cool and staying cool. He's not even breaking a sweat here, man. So, um, I just think it's impressive, you know. Well, I do have my AC cranked up, but, but don't ever tell him I said that because I will lie. <laughs> You know what's what's uh what's funny is a coffee. Yeah, you, you can you can recover Kurt from his. <laughs> I just I had to share. I don't know why I had to share that clip, but I did. Yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> ben Ben says it also sounds like verbs and nouns, imperative, declarative. I like that. Yeah. Um, and Joseph just rejoined. Yeah, very cool. Looks like people are really enjoying this. And I think we need to do a part two, to be honest, because like you were just saying, all the other stuff that we need to cover, going to different screens, how we work with globals versus locals yeah. between screens, because yeah. um, we do it in a way that I, I, I believe the, uh, the good way in which that you taught me good programming practices over 20 years ago. Um, so, okay. We need to get to this. Um, so that's uh, the point at which we're at right here. Multiple row selection. So sometimes, you know, with a combo box, you can select multiple things. 
Well, why can't we do that with a gallery? Well, inherently, the gallery doesn't provide that. It doesn't have a property called allow multiple selections. But maybe it should. I mean, probably make it a, a lot more complex. But we could actually implement that. It, and we'll, it, gives, it certainly gives us the flexibility to do it, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's very flexible. Um, so we, we did talk about binding controls. Uh, so we've, we've done that. Processing groups of rows at once. Maybe for emailing, deleting, updating, adding rows to a, a different table on the side or on a different screen, or for filtering. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff we can do here. Let's let's uh, sort of traverse, um, you know, what's what's coming up here. Dynamic adding new blank rows that actually came up. That was the inspiration. Yeah, yeah. That, that, some, is, that, that is something that you've done. I watched you do it. This is some cool stuff. We've got to do a whole section on that, man. And you got to go real slow so people get it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that was actually the inspiration for, the, for this live stream. I mean, it was like, well, before we do that, we need to cover this. Um, <laughs> inline editing. That's a big one. People want to do inline editing. You know, why? Why bring over a form or individual controls on the side? Let's just have all the controls inside the gallery. We can make that gallery row, that template, like really big. We yeah. It's almost like a form inside yeah. of a gallery. How crazy would that be? You could do it. We've talked a, a bit about data binding. I feel like we, we've covered that uh, using a gallery instead of a combo box. Okay. So I think, let me put stars beside... Three stars, uh, or maybe I'll just use some weird um, gee whiz. I just want to say, Darren, I think that using a gallery instead of a combo box, I think that inherently uh, the things that we're going to be talking about, we can do multiple selections and doing groups of process and everything will show us why we would rather do a gallery instead of a, a combo box, right? Yeah, I feel like if we just had like a part two to this, where we talk about these three, these three things, all kinds of things could come out of that. Yeah. And so um, this was pretty much like the basics of like everything that you need to know to master all the basics of a gallery. And now we're like going, taking it to a different level, talking about these more advanced things. I, I would like you to add one line to that if you could, and that would be sure. um, edit, editing records from a gallery. You know, like like in other words, you're going to be launching. You get we're going to be, or better put. Um, editing records based on a gallery selection. How is that? Okay. Um, like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and guys, we're keeping an eye on the comments right now. For you guys that are watching, type in the comments right now. What is it about? Now you saw the title to this video, everything that you wanted to know about a gallery. Well, Darren, Kurt, you didn't cover this. You didn't cover this. You didn't cover that. That's what I was expecting. Type it up in the comments right now. And yeah. we're going to add it in the part two. Okay. Let's do it. Good idea. Good idea. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> so I I have something here ready for you guys. I want to talk to you about what we do uh, most of the week. Um, so you guys might be interested in this. Check this out has been the key ingredient for the hundreds of people that we've helped dominate in their organization. With this one skill, you're able to simplify processes for countless tasks like tracking leads, doing inspections, logging attendance, booking desks in a shared office, generating reports, tracking employee performance, and the list goes on. If you have a project that you need to get done or you're an IT professional or a developer, or if you plan to eventually do some freelancing work with Microsoft Power Apps, I am literally the only person you need to accomplish your goals spreadsheets and all the old ways of doing things are becoming redundant and the people who are able to build power apps are going to accelerate the professional career so much faster than everyone else who's okay being average. I have over 20 years experience as a software developer and have been working in power apps for over three years. We have lots of course material for you, but if you're eager to accelerate your expertise with power apps at a much faster pace and want to work directly with me, this is what me and my team are going to do for you. Number one, we're going to figure out exactly what project 
projects and skills you're working on and the overall end goal. Number two, we're going to get clear on exactly what data sources are needed for your projects. If it's a particular project with a deadline, we're going to work with you to make sure that you meet that deadline. And number four, we're going to work with you to make sure that you master the platform. So not only can you finish any projects that you're currently working on, but the projects that come up in the future. And you might want to take those skills and become a freelancer in the future. If that sounds like something that you're interested in and you want to expedite the process of being able to build apps that can literally be used for years and you want to be an important asset to your organization and any future companies you work for, click the button below and we can have a 15 minute chat about what you're needing and how we can help. What do you think about that, Kurt? Um, is there anything that you'd like to to uh, tell the viewers about the accelerator program? We help people with their projects. We commit to you for 12 months and help you make sure you reach your your power apps goals. Yeah, and and really this this uh and, and there's accelerator students that are watching this right now. You guys can ch chime in on the comments if you want. Um, this is what we do every day in accelerator. This is the kind of stuff that we do. This is uh I I love it. The the video content that we make the um. You know, it's different than what we do for everywhere else. Uh, we get into the deep weeds of everything. And I don't know. I, it just seems like I have seen some really great results come out of these accelerator students. I mean, I see where they came in and I see what, where they're at in three months and then six months. And it just amazes me the growth that I've seen. So there's something about this accelerator offering this model that's just very powerful, man. It's it's basically like today, today, this gallery, I just felt the energy in it and um, you know, for a live stream, this was an amazing energy, uh, uh, type thing. Um, that's what we do in accelerator. Yeah. Yeah. So the next biggest question, um, that you should be thinking about after, after watching this, Hey, what, what video should I watch next? Anything helpful out of this, a comment or even a like really helps. And YouTube thinks you're going to like this video next. Let's see if they're right. Or you can select this playlist, which I've selected for you based on the content you're currently watching. Guys, got to hurry. Click one of them. Otherwise, YouTube's going to autoplay some other video, which you probably don't want. Thanks. Got the power, Darren. Who's got the power? <laughs>